Hello, everyone. It's a great honor for us to start our first uh, Retina teaching sessions. Uh, this is a great uh, opportunity for us to uh, try to uh, deliver some of the knowledges about the uh, Retina. We have a distinguished uh, panel of speakers uh, with us, but before we start, I would like to convey my uh, gratitude to Professor uh, Mohamed Baradai. He's a co-founder of this group. Uh, and I would also like to uh, thank Eva Farmer for the technical support. Uh, today's speaker are very eminent uh, retina surgeons from all over the world. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor uh, William uh, Freeman. Uh, professor William Freeman is uh, a distinguished professor of ophthalmology and director of the UCSD Jacobs Retina Center in the Retina Fellowship Program and he's the vice chair of the UCSD department. Uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Carlos Mateo. Uh, professor Mateo is uh, a professor at a uh, uh, department uh, consultant of uh, vitro-retinal surgery consultant of IMO Spain. Uh, together we have uh, myself, I'm Revesa, I'm a professor in Alexandria University. Uh, professor Mohsen Abushusha is a professor in Alexandria uh, University. I'm honored to have with me uh, Professor Carl Rigello. He was my mentor back at Will's Eye and I really learned so much from him. Uh, Dr. Rigello, uh, he is currently uh, the uh, uh, head of the retina service at Will's Eye Hospital. Uh, uh, he is uh, also uh, professor of Ophthalmology at Thomas, uh, Thomas Jefferson University School of Medicine, and uh, he uh, is the founder and former director of the Wills Eye Clinical Retina Research Unit. Uh, he is prior chairman of the Wills Eye Institutional Review Board and prior chairman of the American Academy's Basic and Clinical Science course. Uh, we have also with us uh, Dr. Tarek Hassan. Uh, He's a professor of ophthalmology at Auckland University, uh, William Beeman School of Medicine, director of the Vitro Retinal Training Associated Retinal Consultant in Royal Oak, Michigan. Uh, and finally, last but not least, we have with us uh, my professor, Professor, uh, uh, excuse me, we have uh, Professor Noor Akar, professor of ophthalmology in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. And finally, we have Dr. Uh, Ashraf Sharawi, uh, he's my professor, a professor of uh, uh, ophthalmology and vitro-retinal consultant at Alexandria University, Egypt. Uh, we are going to start with uh, Professor William Freeman, and he's going to talk with us about the visualization system ingenuity heads up versus binocular. You can start sharing your screen, please, Doctor. Thank you. Here. And I'm going to share a screen. Can everybody hear me? I'm assuming yes. Yes? Okay. So we've been working with a digital heads-up surgical system for about four years now, and we've watched it evolve. And I wanted to share with the group uh, our experience and our evaluations uh, of the of the instrument. So I, I want to stress that Alcon now makes this device, but these are my slides. These are not images provided by Alcon, and I'm giving you my opinions, the good and the bad, and and the things that you should know. Uh, about this. Normally, I actually have this presentation as a 3D presentation, so I've cut off the image on the right edge of the screen, which is just the stereo uh, image. But with this type of heads-up surgery, what's very striking is surgery is now an intimate experience. You, what you do is seen by everybody. Any mistake that you make is seen by everybody. Uh, and everyone is looking at the same thing. And because of this, the technicians, the nurses, assistants can also help you much better because they can immediately see what instruments you may need, what has to be changed, et cetera. 
So if you look at the microscope, there are no oculars anymore. And instead, there's a small camera on top of the microscope, and you're looking at a large organic LCD display, which is connected uh, to the vitrector uh, and to the microscope itself. Uh, the visualization is very good. Uh, this is with a wide angle contact lens. You can see that you can get out to the equator easily. This is an air fluid exchange. Uh, and what's nice about this is that the nurse and the technicians can watch everything that you do and uh, can anticipate everything. You have to wear 3D glasses. These are circular polarized glasses. But when you need an instrument, the technician knows why and can anticipate you and can be, in my opinion, much more helpful. In our institution, this is used almost exclusively by the retina service. Uh, we all use this for our routine cases. The anterior segment surgeons tend to stay with the microscope because we have only one of these. But when we do combined vitrectomy and cataract surgery, as you can see, the visualization is very good. And you do have to change the settings a little bit for the red reflex and to see the capsule uh, during, uh, during cataract surgery, but it does work very well. We use this for complicated cases of PVR. This is a 20 gauge case where you have to peel membranes and try to visualize the texture of the membrane and peel it very carefully. And it is no problem in visualizing the, the tissue at all. When I started using this, this machine, I was a little bit nervous and I decided that I would do six cases in a row that day. And by the second case, I was very comfortable. It's a very interesting uh, experience. Again, what happens is the screen is at the foot of the bed. It's a little bit closer than the foot of the bed to give the optimal view. And you do have to turn your head very slightly to the right, maybe 10 or 15 degrees to see the display, but it really does not seem uh, to be a problem. We're all used to the vitrectomy machine giving us information about the cutting rate, the percentage of the light pipe, the light intensity, the, the type of probe, et cetera. In the second software iteration, Alcon has placed all of this information on the screen that you're operating on. So while you're looking at the eye and you're doing your surgery, all of the other information like intraocular pressure is being displayed along the edges of the screen. So you're very, very immersed in the surgery and you don't have to ask anybody, what is the light pipe intensity? What's the pressure? It's right there for you. And everybody else sees it as well. So we were happy with this, but we wanted to do some scientific studies of this device. And we wanted to look at the resolution and the depth of field, and there's been debate about this. So we had six experienced retina specialists give their resolution and contrast impressions going back and forth from the ingenuity to the regular oculars. And then we used the uh, US Air Force resolution target and some other optical uh, instruments to determine the actual resolution of the Alcon True Vision system compared to what happens uh, through the eyepieces. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the US Air Force and bombing uh, techniques will recognize this target, which is a laser etched uh, glass that has con concentric circles to determine the resolution of any optical system. And the surgeons had to look through the microscope with the eyepieces as well as through the digital system. And we determined the resolution in air. And to look at depth of field, we had a 45 degree angled calibrated device when we could determine the upper and lower limits of our depth of field. So this was done objectively as well as subjectively. So we had 240 cases. 
uh, five physicians or five retina specialists. We had digital cases. And the same week, we had contemporaneous controls with the optical microscope. Obviously, the surgeon can't be masked. You know what you're, what you're looking at. And when we looked at the scoring of uh, depth of field in, in certain magnifications, contrast, color, the ease of visualization through media opacities and small pupils, we found that the systems were very similar. There was a slight improvement in depth of field at high magnification with the digital system. This is because the camera is very sensitive, so the aperture in the system can be decreased, so you're operating through effectively a smaller opening. And of course, the depth of field or depth of focus is increased. Now, when we looked at the resolution targets and looked at things in air, so we have the microscope and we're viewing this Air Force resolution target, things are different. And the resolution through the eyepiece in air is almost twice as high as it is through the digital system. The digital system is double high definition. So each eye is a 2K, uh, a two megabyte view or, or double high def, but you get better resolution if you look at a flat etched piece of glass uh, with the analog system, not with the digital system. The depth of field is a little bit better with the digital system, but uh, the depth of field is better because the aperture is smaller. That is the reason. The resolution in air, that improvement is not seen surgically by the surgeon because our resolution is not equal to the resolution in air. We have to look through the cornea, sometimes the lens, to visualize the retina. So resolution is lowered overall by looking through the ocular media. So clinically, the systems are the same, but if you look at pure optical resolution, it's better through a microscope. One question about this system is whether there's a delay or a lag time. So this is me moving a 25 gauge needle back and forth. And this is the older ingenuity with the standard uh, screen. And then if you look at the, the uh, low latency display where the, in, where the instrument has a faster cycling time, I don't see any latency with either. So I don't think there's any issue of latency or delay between your movement and what you see actually on the screen. And I just want to show you again that, that I use this for all my cases. So if I have a delicate uh, poster hyaloid dissection in a diabetic, uh, this is one where we use purified triamcinolone on the retina. Uh, there's really no issue with, with being able to do that. Uh, here is a case of the Genentech sustained release implant with Lucentis. So this is more like an anterior segment surgery, but you can see how easily you see the change in color of the choroid as you cauterize it. When we enter the eye, you can immediately see the vitreous prolapse. Uh, there's no issue. Here's insertion of the Genentech port delivery system. Uh, you can see the septum in the middle of it, which is where we uh, fill the device with Lucentis. So we've used this for all types of surgery. Here's a complicated diabetic. And uh, for those of you who occasionally still use scissors, uh, Tariq, I don't know if you use them anymore, or Carl, if you do, but in very thick membranes, it's sometimes nice to use 20 gauge vertical cutting scissors. And you can see the plane of the membrane when you take it off the retina. Uh, the ingenuity visualizes things very well. So early attempts at 3D surgery had been made, and they were really not very good. Uh, as you see in this small accident here, that, that is me. But other iterations, uh, the newest iteration of the ingenuity really did get it right. And uh, here is my similar jump as I landed correctly. So I would say that this is a fantastic technique for teaching. There's nothing like the video quality of this. You can have 3D videos, and I'm addicted uh, to this 
device, and I would suggest that those of you who have access to it, uh, try it. And I will conclude with that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, does any one of the panelists have a comment? We don't have any questions or answers so far. I have just one comment Dr. Shalawi, about uh, uh, the system. <clears throat> I would like to congratulate uh, uh, Professor Freeman about this presentation because uh, really I tried the 3D system and what was very nice about it that with uh, by manual surgery for uh, treatment of diabetics uh, with any type of chandelier with the poor illumination of the chandelier the digitally enhanced image by the system helps you very much to see the fine details even with the chandelier so it turns your life to a by manual uh, uh, mode of life which is much easier in diabetics and even in PBR because the chandelier is always enhanced and give you the best resolution and the best illumination. Right, so what, what Dr. Sharaway is saying is that you need less light with this system because the camera is actually more sensitive than your eye. You get amazing visualization. So if you're using the chandelier light and the illumination is not so good, you may see it better with this because the camera quality is so good. And I completely agree with that. That is an advantage. Would you substitute it for a normal binocular microscope, Dr. Freeman? Well, I have substituted it. So in the last three years, I've, well, it's the same. I use a Leica microscope. We just take off the oculars. And also, you're not sharing the light. So, you know, when you're set up with an assistant, you're seeing part of the view, an assistant is getting part of the light, depending on the microscope, and then your camera system is. With this, there's only one light path. So the last time I had to operate in a different room, and I sat down at the microscope, and I looked up, and there was something wrong. And I realized there was no ingenuity screen. I had to look down to the eyepieces the way I was trained. Okay. How's, now, for Rebecca? Yeah. how's, how's the turnover compared to the, uh, to the optical system? The, the turnover of the patients, the, you know, the speed between patients and, you know, is this longer the period? Or is this no, same? it's the same. It, 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 is, it is the same. The, there's no doubt that when you first try anything new, you know, there's, there's some uh, delay. But when we're done with the case, the screen is just moved uh, one meter back against the wall and the patient exits the room. Everything is the same. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. If you are alternating with someone who is not using the machine, so you do a case, someone else does it, then they have to take the oculars off and put the camera on, but for our technicians, that's about takes a minute. It's very simple. Bill, this is Dr. Terry. Dr. Hassan wants to ask. Yeah, so hey Bill, a great presentation. Very uh, nice work. You know, what's interesting uh, is some data that David Chow has done in, in Canada with a lot of the parameters around ingenuity. And one of the things that he found is that the ingenuity system, the 3D system, really maximizes its benefit to people who are getting more and more presbyopic. And I'm kind of curious as to what age the subjects were that tried your system in your study, because his data would suggest that younger people, and, I, and I've sort of noticed this with my fellows too, because I've been using this system for five years as well. I find it to be more of a wow than the ones that are 30 years old and 31, 32 years old. And so it's an interesting feature that the older the surgeon, even just reaching presbyopic age, tend to notice the benefits of this system more than the, than the younger surgeon. So I have not found that. We, this, we, we did two studies. The one I presented 
We have our youngest surgeon was probably 33. Oldest was uh, in his mid 70s. And we did a separate study, which I didn't share with you, in an animal lab looking at alternating anterior segment surgery with ingenuity and the regular instruments. And there was actually no relationship of age or even surgical experience. That surprised me. Uh, people who, were tr who had used ingenuity for the first time thought it was slower. And these were trainees who were first learning cataract surgery. But I'm not sure why that should be because, you know, the microscope is focusing for us. The, the, uh, whether we're looking at a screen or in the eyepieces, we're kind of at optical infinity. So I'm not sure why age would, would do it, but we have not noticed that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Now we, we will turn on to one of our most popular speakers, uh, Professor Matteo. Uh, he will be speaking to us about retinal tamponade, including gas silicon and short-term PFCL. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Matteo. Um, after this wonderful and, you know, uh, so sophisticated talk, it was a great thing, the new uh, 3D systems. I'm going to speak to you know, a very, 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 very basic topic is a, a tamponade and uh, with gas, heavy silicone, not heavy and heavy silicone. You know, let me, um, oh, let me try to, okay. Um, let me define what, what's a tamponade. Tamponade is um, an element that try to close the retinal breaks to help us to reattach the retina. What is an ideal tamponade? The first thing you have to have is that uh, immiscible with water. You know, some children, they use, you know, viscoelastic. The viscoelastic is water, but they may act as a tamponade because of the viscosity. But what, what are the main characteristics for an ideal tamponade? You have to be clear and toxic. The gene that one described this many years ago has to have high water tamponade interface tension, conform well around irregular surfaces, no dispersion or emulsification, is in section and removal and convenient specific, specific gravity. There is no one that is perfect. Even gas is not perfect. You know, how they act, you know, to, to, to reattach the retina. The first thing they do is they keep the whole flat displacing the aqueous from the subretinal retinal space. And you have two main difference. You know, one is because of buoyance forces, the gas or non-heavy silicon oil, or others, they act as a weight, you know, because they sink down. You know, the second thing they do is they prevent bulk flow. This is tamponade, preventing bulk flow of fluid through the break. They occlude the break. And this is, uh, this managed new concepts with uh, interfacial tension, true first tension that we're, uh, we're going to speak about. And when totally filling the vitreous cavity, this is very theoretical. The people think that they obliterate the space in which retinal attachment could occur. But this is theoretical. If you obliterate all the space, you don't produce was that, you know, uh, uh, this is not a good concept to, for, a, for a tamponade. You know, um, you have to, to, to understand three main concepts with the tamponade elements. You have to understand surface tension. This is the attraction that surface molecules suffer from those in the center. You know, water is the most important, seven, uh, 70 earth per centimeter square, silicon oil 20, fluorinated silicon oil, two one, perfluorocarbon liquid, very similar, 16, and gases, they, they don't attract their molecules, uh, the surface from the, from the center. But you know, in the eye, we have two, uh, two surfaces. We have under the retina, fluid, water, and you know, the tampon that you are going to use. Then uh, this, uh, you know, interfacial tension is the surface tension of the interface between two elements. And it's obtained subtracting the surface tension from the lowest to the greatest. And you know, uh, you know, inside the eye, you know, the interface between gases and water is 70. 
if you compare it to silicon oil and water, it's only 50. And if for perfluorocarbon liquid, it's only 54. Then, you know, the best interfacial tension is created when you use gas. And the third is the tamponade force. It, the, the, you know, in the tamponade force, you calculate the difference in density between the, between the two elements, multiply by the, how, how uh, you know, uh, the quantity you leave inside the eye. Imagine that you have silicon oil, this is, this is a 0.94, you subtract this from, from one, and then you obtain at the end a very poor, you know, tamponade effect. The gases have the better, you know, tamponade effect. You know, you subtract one minus zero, you multiply per five, and you obtain a five. You know, this is the most tamponade force you can obtain. Advantages, advantages with gases, you have, they disappear alone. You know, its duration depend of the type of gas and its concentration. It requires more strict positioning. This is very important in difficult cases, in child and disabled people. And they give you a very poor vision, and this is prohibited to trial by plane. Silicon oil, in the contrary, you know, remains in the same volume and it is, you know, um, um, removed from the eye. It requires less stick position and allows ambulatory vision. It allows uh, trial by plane. We use the gases in two different situations. We use as expansibility or longe longevity, and this depends of the lower solubility coefficient of these gases that we use than nitrogen. When you inject a bubble, a pure gas, you know, a bubble of pure gas inside the eye, imagine SF6, what happens is that in the, in the bubble you have only SF6 and, and you don't have nitrogen, oxygen, or CO2. Then in favor of gradient, they enter in the bubble, then they, this make the bubble to increase the size. And after this, they enter in equilibrium, and after all of these molecules are absorbed, you know, a favoring gradient, and then the, 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 the bubble tends, you know, disappears. You cannot trial by plane. You know, if you, you inject the bubble of air, or excuse me, air, gas or air, doesn't matter. At sea level, you know, the size of this bubble depends on, you know, the atmospheric pressure where, where you are plus the pressure inside the eye. But when you take a plane, you know, this, uh, you have a machine inside the plane that, you know, um, makes pressure, pressurize the cabin. And then, but you pressurize to certain limit. And, you know, if you are on uh, in the sea level, the pressure, atmospheric pressure is seven, uh, 760, but you know, in the planes it's 560. Then it makes the bubble to increase in size, and this can promote, you know, a central artery occlusion because of the expansion of the gas. You know, this expansibility that you, uh, the property of expansibility, expansibility, we use it when you perform, you know, um, you know, a scleral surgery. And we, you, we want to avoid the fish mouth phenomenon, or you want to take, you know, profit of the steam roller whatever to remove the fluid from uh, from the uh, from the macular area. Then in retinal detachment, we use longevity when you do when we perform a vitrectomy. And in fresh, no PBR, retinal detachment, air gas is used. In superior breaks, three to nine after two hours, we use air. For inferior breaks and others, multiple different quadrants, we almost always use SF6 20% and we position the head of the patient. Look at this, this is an inferior break. In this case, you can say, okay, if you use um, you know, a bubble of gas, and the patient is looking forward, is looking uh, in front of you, then, you know, the bubble won't cover this, then you have to put the patient to the side, he has to cover the break and to, you know, tampon at the break. But for giant retinal breaks, in general, we use gases, we don't use in general uh, silicon oil. What about silicon oil? Silicon oil is, um, is I think it's more used in Europe than US, and you have two main kinds of silicon oil. You have you know, heavy silicon oils, it floats, and you know, the viscosity, you have different silicon oils, 1,000, 1,300, 2,000, or 5,000 centistokes. Refractive index is 1.4, and you know, the interface tension is not as good as gases. But the tamponade force, as I mentioned before, is 0.3. 
you know, heavy silicone as denser oxygen HD or other, uh, you know, heavy silicone uh, oils that exist, you know, they sink. They do absolutely the same, but they sink. And this is very important for in cases with PBR when we perform, you know, peripheral retinectomies. When we use silicone oil, you know, in severe PBRs, when you have a patient with severe hypotony, severe trauma, patients that are not able to position or they need to travel by airplane, it's very variable, giant retinal breaks to prevent slippage PDR, severe PDR to prevent massive, you know, vitreous hemorrhage and to buy time for immature membranes in PBR. Look at this, this is a wonderful paper I found it many years ago, 20 years ago was written by David Wong. It was explaining that many surgeons, they use direct perfluorocarbon liquid silicone oil exchange to avoid slippage and to avoid, you know, fluid under the retina. You know, and, and he explained with a special camera they, they, they built, and, and they show how the silicone oil, when enters in contact with the perfluorocarbon, they form a, a unique interface, and then they leave the water in the anterior part, then this uh, avoids, you know, the slippage, the, some surgeons, you know, complain for the giant retinal breaks. In giant retinal breaks, I have to confess that I confess that I always use SF6 20%. I, I don't use C3 fade. I think it's too long. And even in cases with initial PBR, as you can see in your right, but in cases where, you know, it's stickler syndrome, that they are young people in general, or giant 3 and 60 degrees giant retinal breaks, or giant retinal breaks with PBR, as I'm showing you in your down and right, then I use, you know, um, uh, silicone oil instead of gas. In primary PBR, uh, is that haven't treated uh, previously when uh, only uh, posterior PBR is present. You know, I, I you know, I almost use SF6 20%, very rare case I use C3F8. And when you have an anterior and posterior PBR, the very large retinotomy is needed, um, uh, it's very rare. And then I use buccal vitrectomy in all my cases, uh, I use non-heavy silicone oil. But you know, when you have rec recurring PBR eyes that have been treated for, you know, before two or three times before, you know, use non-heavy or heavy silicone oil. Rationally, for these cases to allow the patient to do normal life is very important, believe me, because you know, they have been, you know, face down all of this stuff for months. Silicone oil is better for us with hypotony. It gives you time for immature members to mature. And if the retina begins to detach, you know, it gives you time to, to react. In diabetic retinopathy, in general, you know, even in intractional retinal retinal detachment, we use gases. Normally, it's a 6 20% is preferred. But in some cases, you know, we use silicone oil. And, you know, the, the advantage to use silicone oil, mainly in cases that they have only one eye, but, you know, in very um, in cases that are very active, you prevent massive bleeding. You know, as you can see in these cases, that you prevent massive bleeding in the vitreous cavity, stopping the bleeding, you know, in small uh, cells, you know. But, you know, in some cases that can happen this, you know, you, you do your vitrectomy, you inject previous, previous anti-VHF you want, but then after surgery, you have this massive, you know, soup, uh, silicone oil hemorrhage. My advice, tell me, uh, I have to tell you that, you know, I had this, you know, three or four times. Always I do the same. I don't enter again. Don't go inside the eye. This is very difficult to remove. I did it. It's a total disaster. I strongly recommend to use, you know, injecting once, twice, or three times, you know, uh, RTPA, put the patient face up for 45 minutes, and it will disappear. Don't use, you know, silicone oil in, in optic discs, in colobomas, and don't use silicone oil and perforating trauma because this silicone oil is going to go to the to the uh to the orbit it's very easy i, I did it in this case it was a terrible mistake and i had to remove the silicone oil from the orbit why do i use uh, heavy silicone oil? i think you don't have it in us but you know we have it i i, I use um, uh, heavy silicone oil because in heavy silicone oil the patient looking forward the tamponade effect is very 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 poor if you cut the retina inferior and even if you don't do buccal surgery if you put a buccal 
It maintains fibrin debris cells in the area of previous retinotomy. Remember that, you know, non-heavy silicone oil press up in 100%, 100% but down 0%, then you always see this line down where the non-heavy silicone oil uh, is there. I prefer heavy silicone oil because um, it has a good tamponade effect in the retinotomy area. You know, uh, it moves the debris cells to the superior quadrant. You can, evidently, you can shift the PBR. And for me, there are two things that are very, very, very convenient, that easy, complete filling in the vitreous cavity at a convenient pressure and easy removal compared to no heavy silicone oil. Let me, let me explain why I think you better fill the vitreous cavity with heavy silicone oil. This is non heavy silicone oil. At the end, you perform, you know, air perform carbon exchange, but all this fluid that there was in the anterior retina goes down. And then you have subretinal fluid, always you have some subretinal fluid, and some fluid that in, in the vitreous cavity coming from the peripheral vitreous. Then you inject silicone oil, but it floats. Then you maintain this fluid down. This is very difficult to, to fulfill completely the vitreous cavity. Look at this, heavy silicone oil is different. You made the fluid air exchange, and then you put the heavy silicone oil and pushes part of this fluid to the anterior part, and and then part of this will be, uh, you know, towards the lens or toward the intraocular lens or toward the entire chamber. And you won't, be, won't have trapped the subretinal fluid in that. But many surgeons complain about the difficult, uh, the difficult removal of the heavy silicone oil. By far, is by far simple. The only thing, look at this, into the left. This is heavy silicone oil. Always stays down, as you can see here, and it's very simple to remove it. You see it, but you know, heavy silicone oil, the silicone goes up, you know, towards the intraocular lens or towards the iris, and you don't see it. You, you, you try to remove it, and many of them remains attached to the cannulas. That's, in my opinion, is by far more difficult to completely remove the, uh, the non-heavy silicone oil. The last thing I want to mention, I don't know, I want to know, uh, you know, there are some papers saying that, you know, there is no difference in PBR, inferior PBR between uh, heavy silicone oil and non-heavy silicone oil. My, my answer is perhaps we are not so good, you know, removing the immature membrane. You don't see them and then, you know, you can have inferior membranes in inferior quadrants when using heavy silicone oil. Like, uh, you know, uh, the uh, potential drawbacks of the heavy silicone oil is the greater tendency to emulsification and dispersion. Uh, it may shift PBR to superior quadrants and intraocular inflammation, the subtle, you know, intraocular inflammation. And my, my recommendation always is to maintain sterility. I think it's my 10 minutes, uh, you know, went away. And then, you know, I, I want to ask you if you, Anybody of you have seen cases that have pub, uh, been published in Europe you know, of patients that have been treated with silicone oil, uh, macula on retinal detachment, that after removal, the visual acuity went down, went down, and this was not explained of the, you know, because of difficult cases. And you look at this in this patient, in this group of patients, they make a retrospective cohort of patients with macular or ret retinal detachment. And as you can see, the incidence of unexplained visual loss was 0.7% in the, in the group of gas, but in patients treated with silicone oil was near 30% of the patients, you know, have a reduced vision after removal of the silicone oil. Thank you again. I think it's, uh, it's been very basic, but you know, I want to, you know, this is what I wanted to, to, uh, to, uh, to show you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Matteo. Uh, Dr. Mohsen. Dr. Matteo. Thank you, Dr. Matteo. Uh, as usual, very brilliant uh, and interesting presentation. Uh, I just want uh, to ask you two questions. The first question, the first question is about direct silicon oil uh, BFC exchange in giant retinal breaks. Do you have uh, a certain specification for the giant retinal break regarding its size and the size when you choose to make direct silicon oil BFC exchange? Let me tell you, I, I, this, I, I never use it. I, I, there are many surgeons that they clearly prefer to use it to avoid slippage. But you know, the trick, the, tr the real trick to avoid the slippage is to try to remove as much as possible the subretinal fluid. This is for me, the, the, you know, the important point. And the thing I do is, the first thing I do, I do my vitrectomy. I do first, you know, air injection, then the anterior retina, 
those attached to the RP, and then I, I trim the peripheral vitreous, then I do a perfluorocarbon liquid, and then I do the sandwich technique. I go up with the perfluorocarbon liquid and go with the gas, and then you, the, the advantage of this is that you will remove, uh, you know, practically, you, know, you never remove all the subretinal fluid, but you know, the, the removal would be great. And the second thing is that when you are under air, and for carbon liquid, you want to have bubbles of dispersion be, uh, before of the jet stream of the fluid. Then I never do it. But you know, the main advantage is to go uh, for the surgeons that they prefer to do direct exchange is you go for carbon liquid up and then you begin to inject. You have to, you know, try to create this interface, this common interface between the silicon oil and the perfluorocarbon liquid. But at the end, is, for me, it's difficult to control. But, you know, many, many very, very, very skilled surgeons, they prefer to do it. I never do it. I prefer always to go to air first, to see everything. If I see the retina going down, I totally inject perfluorocarbon liquid, and go up and aspirate more, and then I, 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 I never do a direct exchange. Okay. Can I ask Dr. Regello, please, what do you do? Do you do an, uh, an PFC uh, silicone exchange? I, I, I agree with Carlos. That's what I do. I, do I, I don't do a direct, I do not do a direct perfluorocarbon silicone exchange. I always use air intermediary. So I go perfluorocarbon, air, and then silicone. And I'm going to address that in my talk too. I think it's really just personal preference. Carlos is absolutely correct. As long as you've managed subretinal fluid and there's minimal that's left anteriorly and you've relieved all traction, you technically should not have slippage with either technique. Okay, no, uh, Dr. Tariq, the, do you do drying of the edge of the, of the uh, giant retinal tear for a while after air exchange? I, after air yeah, exchange? I, no, I, I do for sure. I think there's a high likelihood of getting some anterior fluid that'll come down around that edge. And I think if you, as the others have uh, mentioned, if you take your time, drain slowly and stay at the edge uh, under air, you are generally very successful at being able to flatten it without any slippage. Okay. May I ask a question to Carlos? Sure. Yeah, Carlos, do you have any experience with a medium term uh, perfluorocarbon liquid left in the eye, you know, two weeks maybe, or? Uh, and how do you feel that compares maybe with using heavy silicone oil? Let me tell you, um, I, I, I use uh, temporary perfluorocarbon liquid uh, 20, 25 years ago. Because at that time I was performing, you know, limited macro translocation. You remember Jim De Juan and all of this stuff. But, you know, in some cases I tried to move the retina upward. And then for these cases, I, 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 instead of put gas to move the retina downward, I was using perfluorocarbon liquid for seven days and then remove it and this, this maintain the retina upward. The thing I observed that in some cases that they couldn't, you know, reoperate in seven days, let's say seven to 10 days, and they have to be more time with perfluorocarbon liquid. I saw in the acute phase, I saw some white cells. And, you know, I, I, I think that I increased the risk of membranes and PBR. Then, you know, uh, let, me, let me ask you what would be the case? Because, you know, in PBR cases, the membrane takes you know, from four to eight weeks to reappear. Then, you know, to maintain perfluorocarbon liquid, you, you are going to have dispersion and you are going to have more white cells. I, I don't see it. And inferior retinal, giant retinal breaks, I don't see them. You know, I don't see, you know, this could be the case. Or for example, uh, macular translocation with three and 60 degrees. Okay, but you know, uh, now we don't perform this kind of surgeries very often. Then I, I don't see, I don't see the, the, you know, where to use it. And for only for seven days or 10 days. Uh, I don't see it. I don't see it. I, I, I don't have it. Apart from the limited macular translocation, I don't have any experience. Um, Dr. Matteo, may I have a question about uh, the diabetic case? You uh, injected it with TBA, yeah. post-operative uh, hemorrhage under the silicone. Can you please give your experience about this interesting case? Yeah, uh, I have in my life uh, three cases, but I, I saw more. And, and you know, uh, terrible, believe me on that. If you use 
silicon oil in a case like this, a very active disease, and the day after you look at the patient, you have a tremendous hemorrhage under the silicon oil. This is fibrin. If you try to go inside and to remove this, it's terrible. It's worse than the memory you removed before. Then my, my advice is inject RTPA, patient looking up, you know, this blood will be in the enteral chamber. And, and in some cases, I, I, I remove the enteral chamber, this blood, and I wait one week and I turn again and I, I, I you know, I inject again uh, um, uh, RTPA just to try to remove this blood from the retina. Believe me, if you go inside to remove this, it's a mess. I, I, I had terrible experiences with that. And then I, I think I, I would recommend not doing it. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. And now, may I ask Professor Bessa to share with us his presentation about the posterior vitreous phase detachment. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abushusha. Uh, now I'm going to, to present this, uh, how to manage the posterior hyaloid. Of course, we all know that uh, proper elevation of the posterior hyaloid is mandatory. We are going now much more basic. It's mandatory for a successful vitrectomy surgery. Uh, vitrectomy is the, the surgery of peel. If you do not remove the posterior hyaloid uh, properly, you're going to be facing uh, either uh, giant retinal tears, recurrence of PVRs, or uh, uh, tractions and uh, uh, failure of surgery. Uh, always remember that uh, a posterior hyaloid could be in one layer, or you can have what we call a vitreous chysis. Uh, back in the old days when we didn't have any proper or not, uh, we didn't have the facility for proper visualization. We used indirect signs like the fish strike sign, where you would apply some vacuum and then you would see the tip of the uh, cannula uh, as if it was struck by a fish. And then you would start peel to uh, watch the wave of PVD uh, arising. Uh, others used uh, micro pick and active aspiration. Uh, so that they can elevate the, uh, the posterior hyaloid from the optic nerve and then uh, try to elevate it. Then came the era of chromovitrectomy, uh, where we used uh, diluted trimcinolone acetonide, and it's a single dose vial containing 40 milligrams per milli. Uh, the first technique uh, we know, that, like in diabetes, we use the block, where you come from the anterior uh, vitreous and then find the space between the a posterior hyaloid and the retina, and uh, they cut this and sever it uh, completely. Uh, the advantage is that when you are pulling on the posterior hyaloid like this, you avoid the occurrence of peripheral tears of the pull. And now, as you can see, we are seeing the wave of uh, uh, posterior hyaloid uh, elevation. Uh, blood is always the best stain. We can use vacuum aspiration. Uh, to elevate the posterior highlight of uh, the patient. And then you can uh, start by performing uh, more vitrectomy so that you can actually enlarge the extent of uh, PVD uh, to be sure that you actually uh, removed uh, the whole uh, posterior highlight. Uh, the main issue is that sometimes you can get lucky. and You can actually see this edge of uh, posterior highlight uh, especially uh, if you're having some form of uh, vitromacular traction or so. And uh, you really don't need here to uh, stain or use chromovitrectomy because you're actually uh, seeing the posterior hyaloid and you can actually follow it in this in block fashion till you reach uh, the central area. Uh, but uh, this led to the appearance of non aspirational techniques to induce posterior vitreous detachment especially in minimum incision vitrectomy. Uh, one uh, recent uh, technique was that they would create this uh, tear in the posterior hyaloid and then would allow uh, aspiration of the fluid to, de to detach uh, this uh, posterior hyaloid till the end of it, and then you can actually remove it safely. Uh, some advocated the use of uh, PFC 
uh, liquids, especially in diabetics or in patients suffering from macular hole detachment, and they would inject PFC through this uh, defect uh, and then lead this uh, PFC so that it can actually detach uh, the whole uh, posterior hyaloid. When you're having vitromacular traction, you actually go uh, around the uh, posterior hyaloid after proper staining with triamcinolone, and then you can actually uh, remove it gently so that not to produce what we call an hydrogenic uh, break or what we call a volcano sign uh, when you're doing this. Uh, this is the classic picture of a wave of uh, PVD occurring. But sometimes you have a taut posterior hyaloid. Taut posterior hyaloid, this is highly adherent. The use of tan or scrapper or a loop can help you uh, try to uh, elevate this posterior hyaloid uh, and always mind that when you do this you're actually just removing the posterior hyaloid you still have an, an ILM underneath uh, to peel. Uh, the use of dyes like tripan blue uh, or BBG can you can actually start by peeling this is the posterior hyaloid and this is not the ILM uh, because you should be restaining and you're going to fight some uh, ILM uh, or even all the ILM still present in this. But this we use as we are having some taut uh, posterior hyaloid. Of course, in any case of retinal detachment, uh, elevation of the posterior hyaloid after the use of trams in alone uh, would be a, a very important step to prevent the occurrence of uh, recurrence in PVR. And in diabetic patients, after proper identification of the posterior hyaloid, uh, elevation of the posterior hyaloid is a must so that you can, if needed, try to do an ILM peel or so. Uh, Philip Story and uh, Garg uh, described a new technique. Uh, they called it the drunk man technique. I actually don't have a video of it, but they said that you can actually start from the optic nerve and move in sideways along the arcades like a drunk man walking. And then you can actually use vacuum of the uh, vitrector to remove the posterior hyaloid and elevate. And if you're having problems downwards uh, on the inferior arcade, you can use the same technique and even use it uh, nasally. Uh, of course, when you're having a complicated cases, bimanual is a very important in elevation of the posterior hyaloid, especially when it becomes fibrotic like the use of an end gripping or the vacuum of a vitrector with a lighted uh, pick. Uh, enzymatic vitrectomy and ph uh, pharmacological uh, vitrodynamics, we used uh, plasmine and ocriplasmine to uh, detach the posterior hyaloid, especially in uh, young patients or uh, children. Uh, it showed some effect, but actually after chromovitrectomy, we really don't think that uh, it is uh, much needed nowadays. And uh, thank you, I finished my uh, presentation. Rob, can I have a question? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure. You hear me? Please. Uh, yeah. In my occupation, yes, sir. Okay, you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, in my occupation, uh, the posterior hyaloid is peculiar. How often you stain once or twice? Yeah, and I also the posterior vitreous space is, uh, the vitreous space is posterior, posterior inserted in my wig patients. And if you try to continue PVD, you might have breaks. Uh, so in such cases, you just shave the vitreous space and leave the posterior hyaloid in a strongly attached area. Uh, what to do? Well, I actually, I think in myopic patients who usually uh, uh, stain, uh, I think uh, one, one, at one patient, I stay, I injected triamcid alone six times, and every time I found uh, another posterior hyaloid, I think you should be uh, oriented about it prior to surgery through OCT uh, if the patient is having uh, vitreous kysis or so. But uh, I think that in most myopic patients, I, I really cannot remove all uh, the posterior hyaloid. So uh, maybe sometimes you can leave some if you fail to do. Uh, because it can actually produce some form of complications trying to do this, like retinal tears or so. Am I here? Come here. Come here. Um, as you, uh, can you hear me? Can I? I, I really don't see you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Now I see you. Okay. 
You mentioned now the, the skysis in high myops. Is this clear? You know, uh, in many high myops, um, but in some emetropic eyes, you can find that you 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 are sure that you remove the vitreous, but you know you 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 have the posterior hyoid attached to the macular area. My question yeah. is yes. 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 No retinal detachment because in some cases at the end you have after this you have an epiretinal membrane. We call this a retinal membrane, perhaps, but the posterior hyoid that remained there. My question to you is a normal retinal detachment, no macular hole, as you showed, and you know you try to find this. You 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 try to see if the macular area perhaps you have the posterior hyoid attached to the macular area or not, or you you leave it and. and no, I, I usually try to remove. Uh, I think we should always try to remove the posterior hyaloid and aim to it, and perhaps use all the available tools to try to remove the posterior hyaloid in such patients. So I mean, because sometimes you see the, the wave sign that you are removing the posterior hyaloid. And it, but it, it's not the posterior hyaloid at all. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, best, uh, may I ask a question, please? Yes, please. Um, can you specify the percent of cases you inject trimethylone to, to identify the posterior hyaloid? Well, I, uh, I, I inject trimethylone in all my cases because I, I really think that, that uh, trimethylone dusting and trimethylone injection and chromovitrectomy is the best for this case. Uh, it gives you very good results. And uh, I, I really don't know why he shouldn't inject. Uh, it, it facilitates uh, visualization. It can actually give you an identification about if the patient is hovering vitreous cases or not. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, our next speaker. Uh, is uh, Professor Mohsen Abushusha, and he will be speaking about membrane dissection in diabetics. Dr. Abushusha. Yeah. Yes, first planar vitrectomy is a successful surgical technique for complications of neurosurgical diabetic retinopathy. And there is many advances in surgical techniques regarding the vitrectomy machines, small gauge vitrectomy, illumination, instrumentation. This advances had allowed better results in vitrectomy for advanced diabetic ID. Now, how to deal with diabetic epiretinal membrane? First, maybe by peeling, delamination, segmentation. Unplug dissection by manual surgical technique and the visco dissection. Now, the first question for diabetic patients or not. To answer the, this question, a review for 14 randomized controlled trials was done involving about 600 patients. Half of them injected before surgery, and the other half was a controlled group. The result, there was less intraoperative bleeding, less endodithermy, shorter duration of surgery, electrogenic plague, and less frequency of using silicon oil and relaxing retinotomy, better postoperative with corrected visual acuity, and less early recurrent vitreous hemorrhage, and if postoperative vitreous hemorrhage occurred, it absorbed more rapidly. And this was injected two to five days prior to the track. Let us discuss about the first technique, which is peeling. Owing to the ischemic atrophic nature of the retina in diabetic eyes, peeling of a retina membrane is risky, and they can cause more iatrogenic breaks compared to other techniques. So we should confine it cautiously to a very limited situation. It is done using serrated forceps or integrating forceps. And this is an example of a diabetic patient with a dense epiretinal membrane. Peeling was used to remove this epiretinal membrane 
Why? Because the posterior hyaloid, the posterior retina is thick and it can withstand the peeling. And whether to remove the ILM or not, this is another issue that will be discussed bit later by my colleague. Second is delamination. We can do delamination of the membrane using cutters or using scissors. When we are talking about the cutter delamination, we are, called, we are talking about shaving high speed, low vacuum, closed by scatter. That can be done in a conformal way. What is meant by conformal? The membrane is directly fed to the mouth of the cutter. And in this technique, the retina is just under the edge of the cutter. Or fold back technique. The membrane is direct, indirectly fed to the mouth of the cutter and the retina is protected from the cutter by the membrane itself. This is an example of shaving. We can see the conformal or the backfold using both technique to finish the epiretinal membrane. Both techniques are valid either backfold or conformal. Another example of epiretinal membrane as shaved using high speed low vacuum closed by cutter. The second is delamination using scissor. We have the horizontal scissor, straight scissor, vertical scissor, and the curved scissor. And for me, the most preferable is the curved scissor. Why? Because the curved scissor needs a little space between the epiretinal membrane and the retina to enter and to dissect. When we are talking about the scissor delamination, we may enter the space between the retina and the epiretinal membrane, and the blades are closed, then open it, which is a wrong technique. Or the blades open and close it after entry, which is also a wrong technique. Why? Because they create a retinal break. The correct way is to enter with the smallest snips between the retina and the epiretinal membrane, which is the best option. This is an example of the scissor by delamination using by manual technique. You can see the smallest snips between the epiretinal membrane and the retina and the horizontal scissor when it is closed it is used as a pick dissecting the epiretinal membrane from the surface of the retina another example using the curved scissor small snips in the space between the retina and the epiretinal membrane, sometimes using the scissor while closed as a big dissecting the epiretinal proliferation. and completing the mission using the cutter. Now, in delamination, the direction of delamination, to delaminate from inside out for, or from outside in. The best is to delaminate from inside out. Why? Because the temporal retina is thicker, more redundant, and the temporal retina is more strong. The retinal membrane is thicker centrally, and the view is better centrally and to avoid detachment of the vessels from the disc. 
This is example of scissor delamination from the temper to the periphery, from the macular area and disc to the periphery. completing the mission using the cutter after scissor delamination. The next is segmentation. The role of segmentation nowadays is to prepare the field for delamination. In a membrane with two epicenters, I'm just segmenting it into two parts to avoid traction on the redundant, on the redundant and atrophic Retina. Another example, we may use more than one segmentation. It's like you are cutting the bridge between the two epicenters. You may be in need to make more than one segmentation to prepare the field for other techniques like delamination. As we can see, we are doing one, two, three, maybe four segmentation to prepare the field for delamination. This is the fourth segmentation in the same case. Now we move to the viscobisection. It is done by injecting a viscous fluid between the retina and the epiretinal tissue to separate hydraulic, hydraulically the epiretinal membrane from adjacent retina. We can inject sodium hyaluronate 1% or 1.4% or methyl cellulose. Of course, the preferred is sodium hyaluronate using a cannula, special cannula, visco cannula by Synergetics. This is the cannula. It's a 25 or 27G cannula. This is uh, the end uh, applied to the viscoelastic material. And this is the trotable and the retractable end. It's a blunt. We can inject through it in between the fibrovascular membrane and the retina. This is an example. I'm entering the space between the retina and the epiretinal membrane using the viscoelastic to elevate the membrane. We can notice the bloodless field we are working. Actually, the viscoelastic is hemostatic, and the blunt edge of the cannula can dissect the membrane safely. Then we can complete the mission using the cutter. Another example, injecting the viscoelastic in the space between the membrane and the retina using the blunt tip of the cannula to bluntly dissect the membrane and the viscoelastic to do a good hemostasis and the bloodless field of dissection. And of course, completing the mission by cutter. We can use viscobisection in a bimanual technique, one hand with and the grabbing forceps and the other with the viscobisection cannula, removing dense epiretinal membrane from the retinal surface and the completing the mission again using the cutter. Injecting the sodium hyaluronate may be fortified by brilliant blue G to highlight more the space between the epiretinal membrane and the retina and to stain any residual proliferation on the retinal surface. Actually, Subretinal bands in diabetics is a rare condition. However, after doing a good job in a complicated case like this, after a long time of working and removal of all 
the epiretinal membrane successful removal of ILM and successful shaving, you can find that the retina is tinted and difficult to flatten. The cause is a subretinal band like this, and through a nasal retinotomy, you can easily remove this subretinal proliferation in a diabetic. And after removal, you can flatten your retina by air fluid exchange and lasering the nasal retinotomy. And just to get some At the end, uh, dealing with diabetic fibrovascular membrane is a challenge that needs you to master a lot of tips and the tricks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Oshusha. I, I have a question for the panel. Uh, do you still use scissors? Can I ask uh, Dr. Akar? Question, Dr. Mohsen. Uh, hi. Uh, hi, to me, Samir? Yeah. Do you still use scissors? Sometimes, if, if we need to, in some ways, we start with the uh, forceps peeling and then with the cutters. And of course, we, the smaller is the cutter uh, is the better because you can just get close in contact with the membranes. But in some cases, still, I may need to go with the bimanual, if especially the epicenters is not single, but it's a broad adhesion. And then uh, I usually, I have been always presenting it since 2014, I think. I usually find it very uh, helpful for me with using the very gentle endodiathermy, just on top of the membranes, but very gentle, just a touch and a touch and a touch. And then with the heat, the membrane gets, uh, how to say, squeezed and lifts up. So it may help. And if I may use uh, need to use a scissors, I prefer the blunt, edge, blunt tip curved scissors. I think it is really because we have seen many scissors there. They were nice, curved scissors is the best, but even the curved tip is really very sharp. You may be, uh, especially for the fellows, beginners, it may, you can cut the retina. And sometimes if there's a bleeding, you can really, uh, very difficult to find a plane. So I think blunt, blunt tipped scissors is my favorite. I sometimes uh, use it. Dr. Um, Matteo, yes. question please. Yes, please go ahead. Sometimes you, uh, um, um, I, I use scissors sometimes because, as, as Nur mentioned, sometimes you need by manual surgery to remove the tissue. Let me let me make one comment on emotion. I, I I love it, and you know, uh, one thing that is very useful visceral lamination is to remove the peripheral hyoid because in some of these cases have the the posterior hyaluron attached in the periphery. You you remove the new vessels, but you know you have all the peripheral you know attachment of the posterior hyaluron. And if you continue, you can inject more and more, and it, you know it helps you to um, to to remove the posterior hyaluron. This is so difficult in these kind of cases. Okay, uh, Doctor Gel, I, I remember the MPC cutter. Do you still use cutter? <laughs> well, that was a long time ago, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think you came and visited us maybe 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we were just, I think actually we're just starting um, uh, some of the small gauge surgery. But I used to use MPCs, yes, during the 20 gauge era mm -hmm. a long time ago. But I uh, haven't used that in many, many years. Uh, I agree. I sometimes still use scissors, but it's rare. Uh, 25, even 27 gauge uh, cutters work so well now. I would say 90, 95% of the diabetic Traction detachments can be done effectively that way with just the cutters. Um, but uh, I, I like the curved uh, scissors that you can get with smaller gauge now, uh, and I'll use those occasionally by manual. Uh, okay, Professor Sharawi, do you, do you use? I'll finish the, the, the scissors issue first. <laughs> Professor Sharawi, do you use scissors? Still use scissors? Extremely rare. If the fiber vascular and the epicenter is too tight, and too strong to be cut by the vitreous cutter, then I may use the scissors to cut it from the flush from the retinal surface. But usually, I use by manually. If I need by manual surgery, 
and the gripping forceps and the vitreous cutter. No scissors. Okay. Dr. Hassan, do you use scissors? Yeah, like, uh, like Ashraf and Carl, very, very rarely now. I think that I like the comment that Ashraf made, which is if you really can't get it with even a 27 gauge cutter, then maybe you need to use either a scissor or sometimes I like to use a lighted pick or a, sort of a flat pick-like instrument or even an MVR blade to separate that extremely tight junction. And then I like the 27 gauge cutter because I think in the end, it gives you more control and is probably the safest way to actually peel these membranes if you if you can get in there. But my impression yeah, is that to, scissors are to not going to, to be, uh, to be uh, acquitted. I mean, you still need them in rare instances, but I don't think that they are going to be abandoned. I mean, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't throw them away, and I would certainly, you know, learn how to use them for sure. But I do think that the techniques and technology behind um, angled cutters, very high speed cutters, very small gauge cutters. Imagine if we get a 29 gauge cutter, for example, that we can stick into an even smaller space with good suction. So I agree, I wouldn't abandon them, but I think the direction is clear that it's going towards mostly cutter-based technology. Professor Barade. Uh, yes, I have a quick, yeah, uh, I really use scissors, but I have just a question. Uh, in, uh, with recent advancement in technology and machines and instrumentation, we can uh, finish the cases without even single hydrogenic break. And at the end of some of these old or chronic cases, we have a uh, uh, visit subretinal fluid, okay? And the retina is still detached by, the, uh, by this fluid. Any one of you drain this fluid or just you leave this uh, uh, retina to flatten by time or, and I want to ask if this, if I don't drain this question, uh, this fluid, uh, would this affect the final visual equity? I want to raise this question. Okay. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, uh, Professor uh, Matteo, okay. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Rigello. Always. Okay. I try always to remove, uh, in this case, you have a lot of fluid under the retina because this fluid sometimes collect in the foveal area and it stays there forever. You know, one year, you know, and the fine function is very low. Then I, if I see, you know, important quantities of fluid, I, I prefer carbon liquid and then mid periphery where then it, there are no tractions, I small retinotomy, gas, and that's done. And I remove as much as possible. Okay, Dr. Hassan. Yeah, I, I'm very similar to Carl. I, I think that, you know, the obviously when the retina is detached, and I'll talk briefly about this in my presentation, you know, you're still, you're, the retina is hypoxic and you are stimulating further scar tissue growth. So I, I do think that in a broad sense, it affects final visual acuity. So if I can safely drain it, I will try to drain it. Hey, Norv, do you would you go for drainage? Uh, actually, I wouldn't <laughs> until now, but maybe I will change my mind <laughs> after this presentation. You're not afraid of subretinal bands and subretinal gliosis if you leave it like this? Actually, they're absorbed usually at my hands, what, I, what I've seen until now, but maybe it may differ according to the systemical stage, status of the patient. It can change. I mean, the, uh, the, the kind of the fluid, how, how long was it there? I think they all differ in the patients. Uh, but and as is in an also retinal detachment, I avoid making a posterior retin retinotomy. But of course, the techniques has evolved, uh, and and equipments we can even peel some little amount of ILM and then drain through, make a hole there, and then drain, and then finish the case. If the fluid okay. is really too high, we can. We can. Do, uh, Dr. Abushusha wanted to say something. Yes, uh, I would add uh, that. Um, Sometimes with um, extensive subretinal fluid, you are not able to laser your, your retina, and uh, you may leave your retina with insufficient laser. This is the first issue. Second issue, I would like to ask the panelists um, about uh, preoperative injection of anti uh, uh Who are injecting and when to inject uh, anti vgf bare to retinal surgery in that? For those who are injecting, can you please raise your hand? It's going to be a very... <laughs> okay, for those who are not injecting. Okay, Dr. Matteo didn't get it. <laughs> I, I, no, 
Oxygen is very active. I inject, but in regular cases, I don't inject anymore. Okay. Now, now we are going to go to Professor Rigello. Uh, he's going to speak to us about PFCL and retinal detachment, pros, cons, and pitfalls. Uh, Dr. Rigello, go ahead. Very good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, everything's fine. Great. Uh, you can see my slides too now? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to be part of this wonderful program. Um, it's my privilege and uh, I'm also sticking to the basics here with regards to perfluorocarbon liquid use, an essential tool that we've had now for many years. In fact, I, I had it even before it was approved in the United States at, during my fellowship. And so I sort of grew up with it. And um, I'll share my thoughts about where I think it's most useful and how to avoid problems, because if not used properly, there can be significant problems with it. Uh, all these problems I should mention are uh, for the most part avoidable, or at least minimized. My financial disclosures really are not relevant here. So I'll be focusing mainly on the use of perfluorocarbon liquid in the setting of primary retinal attachment. And we're all aware of the basic options we have for subretinal fluid removal in the setting of a retinal detachment repair. Uh, perfluorocarbon liquid use, of course, um, to steamroll the retina flat and drain the fluid out through pre-existing peripheral retinal breaks. Um, there's the option of poacher drainage retinotomies and then direct aspiration through pre-existing peripheral retinal breaks. They're all very useful. I think anyone in training or in practice should know how to use all these techniques. Uh, excuse me. So my use of perfluorocarbon has evolved over the years. In fact, I used to use it uh, for the majority of my retinal attachments, but like most people, I think um, we've cut back on its use. And part, part of that is related to cost. Um, and over time, I think we've learned to uh, identify where it's most useful and where it may not be needed at all. It is, after all, a, a, an extra step for some of these cases. So I'd say right now, the breakdown for most of my primary detachments about a third I use for fluorocarbon, about a third for a posterior drainage retinotomy, although I do like to avoid them if I can, and about a third I aspirate through pre-existing perfluorocarbon breaks, and, and I know Tarek's gonna cover the other techniques. So I'll focus on perfluorocarbon. I, I, I find it most useful in very large, extensive detachments, bullous detachments. Obviously, the more complicated retinal detachments, such as those associated with giant tears, and then we'll talk about PBR, where you have to make large retinectomies. I think it is a useful technique to minimize post-operative macular distortion or folding, although um, any of these techniques, you can get folds through the macula if, uh, if not utilized properly. For posterior drainage retinotomy, my preference here is tends to be smaller RDs, or superior RDs. Uh, nasal, of course, is a, is a no-brainer. That's easy. Um, I avoid posterior drainage retinotomies, though, in cases that I think are at high risk for PBR, and I avoid uh, temporal to the macular openings uh, for drainage directly. Um, ideally, I think if you can aspirate through the pre-existing uh, peripheral retinal break, uh, that's uh, most efficient, most cost-effective, probably about a third of my cases, and uh, clearly a good technique for more posterior breaks, smaller detachments, especially macular on detachments, I'll consider this, this approach. However, what about the problems? We, you decided to use perfluorocarbon liquid, and now it's about using it properly. Um, so, the problems, subretinal perfluorocarbon liquid is a problem if it's in the center of the macula. Now it's well tolerated elsewhere. You don't have to go back and remove it. Um, it, it is an inert liquid. Um, and again, well tolerated if it's outside the macula, but in the center of the macula, such as shown here in this OCT, that has to be removed and has to be removed in what we'll say a timely manner. Most people would agree within a few weeks. So best to avoid that happening altogether to avoid a second operation, sorry. Um, Retain perfluorocarbon liquid in the vitreous cavity, pre-retinal, uh, really not a problem per se. It's, it's well tolerated. Again, it's inert in small amounts. It shouldn't, shouldn't really cause any inflammation. Uh, however, some patients do find that symptomatic and you should consider that bad form. And so it's best to get it all out and there are techniques to maximize that. Displacement of fluid, subretinal fluid in the macula. Now this is where the use of perfluoro can be associated with promotion of a macular fold, especially one of those detachments that is uh, bisecting the macula. Um, 
if you have excessive trapped anterior subretinal fluid, if you don't manage the anterior subretinal fluid, and that is driven posteriorly during your perfluorocarbon air exchange, you can get trapped posterior fluid and exacerbate uh, the, the macular ectopia distortion or even uh, create a fold. So how do we avoid these problems? And I'll show some videos in terms of putting in perfluoro and taking it out, techniques I use. But first and foremost, I can't imagine anyone out there is not using valved cannulas. Um, when the cannulas first came about, they weren't valved and, and uh, using perfluoro actually became challenging because it would bubble up uh, with the flow uh, of fluids through the eyes through non-valved cannulas. But even with valved cannulas, which uh, I don't see a reason why we ever should not use it, it does help to minimize this bubbling and dispersion of perfluoro because that's going to increase your risk of small bubbles migrating through pre-existing retinal breaks into the subretinal space. And if you're doing a macula off case, that's when you can get submacular perfluoro. Um, but valve cannulas, essentially, I use them in all cases, of course. But uh, valves can sometimes become incompetent. Certainly, you want to avoid cutting with your vitrector as you remove it out of the eye uh, to make sure your valves stay competent throughout the entire operation. Uh, some surgeons like to, used to actually, in the old 20 gauge, days used to like to cut as they remove the instrument, uh, but that's not uh, good for your valve. Um, so keep the valve competent, and in long cases, sometimes um, it, will, it will loosen up. And with, with regards to perfluorocarbon use, um, a lot of folks like to advocate partial fills to stabilize the peripheral retina. If you don't have an assistant and you have a very bullish RD, that's not a bad technique. If you're going to do that, a partial pill of, fill of perfluorocarbon liquid, best to keep it relatively low and the level of perfluoro away from the peripheral retinal break uh, because uh, as you move instruments in and out you can sometimes get bubbling as you tilt the globe around and do your peripheral dissection uh, you can get small uh, satellite bubbles that could migrate into the break. I tend to avoid that if I have a bullous RD uh, early on in the case after starting the vitrectomy I'll go amputate the, t uh, the flap of the tear and usually get the, the bullous RD to settle down nicely and I can avoid partial perfluorocarbon uh, liquid fills in many cases or uh, most cases really. Probably the most useful pearl uh, I'll, I've learned through the years is I now am very generous at not only trimming the flap but opening the break and extending the tear anteriorly, especially uh, a retinal break in its usual location, not too posteriorly. Um, by doing so, when you fill the eye up with perfluorocarbon liquid all the way up, uh, you'll, you'll get rid of, you'll have a more complete removal of subretinal fluid if you've extended the peripheral retinal break anteriorly. So I'm very generous with opening it up and extending it anteriorly. And that's also a useful technique when you're doing direct drainage, at least to enlarge it, and in addition to just amputate the flap. On the video you saw, uh, you can, it's, it's going in a loop, so it's going over and over. Uh, you'll see the, the peripheral retinal break. It's a bullous RD, but as you, you see, we trim the flap there. As we get close to the flap, trim it, you can see it immediately settle. This video is not showing, though, anteriorizing um, uh, the, the opening, which, again, is a very useful, and it's part of uh, getting a very complete removal of subretinal fluid when you use perfluorocarbon liquid. So when you use perfluoro, uh, I like to inject it slowly and try to keep it, of course, as one bubble throughout, as the video is showing. And, um, and removal is also done relatively slowly. So when it's filled, you want to tilt the globe away from the break. That allows subretinal fluid away from the break anteriorly to migrate out the break. So again, fill it slowly over the optic nerve as shown here, uh, not forcefully. You can sometimes get a forceful jet of perfluoro that could go break through the retina and go subretinal. So never fill it pointing to the macula. I usually fill it nasal uh, to the optic nerve. And then uh, once it's completely filled, uh, ideally completely encircle the retinal break with the laser. And again, if you've anteriorized your retinal break, there's no trapped subretinal fluid anteriorly. You can do that in one step rather than two steps having to go back later after the perfluoro air exchange. When removing perfluorocarbon liquid, uh, it's been mentioned earlier tonight, of course, to uh, once the air starts to go in, you're gonna have a, a layer of uh, fluid, uh, of um, VSS between the air and the perfluorocarbon interface. That should be removed first. 
then go right to the break itself. I'm very aggressive at wicking and, and aspirating over the retinal break, especially the larger, more posterior breaks, trying to capture and remove all trapped subretinal fluid anteriorly, and then slowly go to the optic nerve and slowly uh, remove the rest of the perfluorocarbon liquid. And 95% uh, of the time, uh, you, you should not see significant amount of fluid migrate posteriorly. You'll see a little bit in the mid-periphery typically, but uh, never should it uh, any little bit of trapped subretinal fluid during your air, air perfluorocarbon exchange go back into the macula. I strongly advocate the rinse maneuver. This is how you minimize leaving perfluorocarbon small bubbles left in the eye. Um, so after a complete air fluid exchange, I add back a little bit of BSS over the posterior pole and then re-aspirate. Very useful technique to ensure that you you get it all out, get all the perfluorocarbon out. And then at that point, once the eye is filled with air, I'll then call uh, for the scrub nurse to uh, mix up the gas. I don't do that ahead of time because it will dilute, uh, but I use that time, that minute that the uh, circulating nurse um, or the scrub nurse is going to get the gas and, um, and uh, get the right mixture to vent. And theoretically, venting with some flow of air uh, in the eye can help facilitate by evaporative, evaporative uh, technique, uh, ev evaporate any small perfluorocarbon bubbles that might still be there. For the retinal tantrums with PVR, really all the same principles apply. Um, this is the type of case where you're gonna go in, peel, do a large inferior retinectomy. Uh, of course, uh, I will use perfluorocarbon liquid in that setting, it's like a giant tear. Um, and then uh, we talked about this earlier, I do an air, uh, perfluoro silicone exchange. Of course, you can do a direct perfluorocarbon silicone exchange. I think that's really a matter of preference and what you're most comfortable with. I don't think one technique is better than the other. Um, again, uh, slippage should not occur if you've relieved all traction um, and removed the anterior subretinal fluid. Uh, wicking, as was mentioned earlier, wicking the posterior edge of that retinectomy, especially the most posterior aspect to it, is, is important. Uh, to make sure there's no residual subretinal fluid that will migrate posteriorly or cause um, some sort of uh, movement to the retina. In these cases, when I'm putting oil in, I don't bother with the perfluorocarbon rinse if there's small little bubbles left in. Again, it's well tolerated. I know I'll get that out later when I remove the silicone oil a few months down the line. Uh, this is just a couple of uh, simple videos to, to demonstrate. This is a primary RD. It's actually a fairly extensive, albeit shallow one, I'm looking at the break, I'm opening it up uh, and uh, anteriorizing it as we talked about. Uh, perfluorocarbons being instilled slowly, bad technique, injecting it over the macula, but nonetheless, um, uh, it's completely filled now with perfluoro and I'm gonna laser the adjacent lattice and the, the break itself, all the breaks at this point. And, and uh, here's a case of PVR. It's not terrible PVR, but there was significant um, uh, uh, anterior uh, base contracture, uh, stretch breaks occurring at old uh, uh, laser treatment sites. Uh, this case was deemed necessary to do an inferior retinectomy, uh, and that's what you're seeing here. I like to use some diathermy at the blood vessels uh, where I'd like to make the cut. Of course, I'll be removing um, the retina anterior to that cut all the way to the aura, so there's no residual uh, retina anterior to the retinectomy. Um, cutting the retina here, minimizing the bleeding. Uh, effectively, you now got a giant retinal tear and perfluorocarbon is installed nice and slowly. Um, and you'll get very, very good anatomy. Um, again, with perfluoro going in slowly and coming out slowly, uh, laser along the edge, and then the air fluid exchange, uh, as we talked about, wicking the edge of the retinectomy as shown here. And um, uh, this, this should look perfect when you're done. If it doesn't look perfect, you need to consider that the retinectomy is not large enough. Anything less than 180 degrees, if there is truly significant PVR, is usually inadequate. This was actually a post-op photo of that same case after the oil was removed several months later. The patient had an excellent outcome. So in summary, perfluorocarbon liquid is an important tool that we all have to know how to use well. Uh, I, I consider among the major advances in retinal tantrum repair, certainly for the more complicated ones, we could live without it with primary RDs for sure. Our other techniques are very good uh, and comparable in many ways. Um, but nonetheless, um, I like 
uh, to use it in very extensive RDs. There's excellent visualization, of course, under fluid. I think you can get excellent displacement of macular subretinal fluid when used properly and have very good vision outcomes in macular off detachments. And um, because uh, if used properly, you can get a very complete removal of subretinal fluid intraoperatively, uh, I very rarely put patients face down uh, after surgery when I use perfluorocarbon liquid. And in large cases, again, uh, no slippage if, if everything, if all the traction is relieved. And to summarize, the best practices to uh, minimize or retain perfluorocarbon liquid, whether it's under the retina, of course, or, or in the vitreous cavity, valve cannulas for sure, no reason not to use them. Um, enlarge and extend the brakes anteriorly, as we talked about. Instill and remove perfluorocarbon slowly. Keep it, try to keep it as one bubble. I forgot to mention uh, also upon removal, uh, when you finally get the last bit of perfluorocarbon out, it's always best to keep aspiration on while you remove the extrusion cannula so it, perfluorocarbon bubbles don't drip back into the vitreous cavity after you've done your perfluoro air exchange. Um, aspirating over the break first when you're um, uh, doing the perfluoro air exchange to remove that anterior subretinal fluid is important. Again, keep aspiration as you remove it. The rinse maneuver is important and then the venting. And uh, I, mean, I welcome now everyone else's comments, suggestions, and pearls. Well, thank you so much, Professor Rogello, for this uh, nice uh, presentation. May I ask you a question? Uh, do you still resort to uh, uh, retinotomy in, in surgeries? You mean posterior drainage retinotomy? Yeah. yeah. yeah I, as I mentioned in one of my early slides, about a third of my cases, I will do that. You know, um, um, I like to, if I'm going to make a retinotomy, it's usually a superior detachment, uh, nasal detachment. I don't usually do them for inferior detachments. I'll use perfluoro in that setting. Um, but yeah, I make it. I just like to avoid making a posterior drainage retinotomy uh, temporal to the macula or close to the center of the macula. Uh, because if there is proliferation, if those patients do go into PVR, then you've got contraction in that area and it can often distort the macula. It's not common. You can get away with it in many cases, but nonetheless, um, I like to avoid it if I can in those settings. Okay, another question. Do you, do you do still uh, perform 360 degree laser for retinal attachments? Uh, no, I, I uh, uh, did I do that when you visited uh, many years yeah. ago? I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. do not, <laughs> no. I stopped that years ago. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> I only laser the pathology, only laser breaks, the lattice, thin areas, suspicious areas. I do not do 3C laser. Okay. That, was, that was popular, you're right, in the days of uh, advocating primary vitrectomy for pseudophagic RDs uh, for fear of missing small breaks and so forth, I think. But with wide field viewing, I think those were days before we even had wide field viewing. So those are really ancient days. Wide field viewing is probably the most single most uh, advanced in vitreoretinal surgery because of visualization. It's all about visualization. Okay. Uh, Professor, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. For again, uh, may I ask a question, please? Um, during injection of perfluorocarbon liquid, uh, how you um, maintain the pressure inside the eye, uh, especially you are using a uh, wheel valve cannula? Yeah. Um, some people uh, like to use the Med1 uh, uh, vented cannula. I, I don't. What I like to do is, when I'm instilling it slowly anyways, and I take my hand, if you can see my pencil, and I move to, move to the side of the valve, and it can tends to open up the valve enough in most patients. If you've done a very complete vitrectomy, which I do advocate in the setting of even primary retinal attachments, you're not getting vitreous clogging up that site uh, where the trocar is. Um, so I'll uh, just take my hand and move it slightly to the side, and it's usually enough to open up the valve and get some venting when I instill the perfluoro. Actually, I'm using another technique. Usually, I'm using a bimanual technique. I'm entering with a vitrector from one side, aspiration on aspiration mode, and injecting from the other side. Uh, and uh, this is how I maintain the intraocular pressure. Yeah. But it needs, of course, bimanual surgery. Yeah, I think it, sometimes if you start instilling, you see the pressure going up and the optic nerve not perfused. Um, it's usually because there's some vitreous uh, up, uh, up around the cannulas uh, plugging it and therefore not allowing egress of the uh, fluid in the eye when you're instilling the perfluoro. Anybody want to ask any question? 
have a um, oh. question because this is for train to train people. Um, do, do, you, do you? I know you know. We don't remove all the subretinal fluid with perfluorocarbon liquid. We never. Absolutely right. Okay. There's let me, there's no technique. Right. Let me ask you one thing. Sure. The, I love to discuss bolus retinal detachment. What you you mentioned, and you know the line of the detachment is in the middle of the fovea. How do you avoid? at the end of fluid exchange to collect some fluid there and to avoid these tiny faults, but at the end they, they may be symptomatic and, and how do you do it? You're absolutely right. No technique allows you to completely remove subretinal fluid. There's always going to be something trapped to some degree posteriorly. Obviously, the less trapped fluid, regardless of technique, the less trapped fluid you have in the macula, the less likely you are to get displacement um, or enfolding. But you're right, the worst case, I dread going into cases where the RD bisects the fovea. Those patients are always symptomatic, even if anatomically there's no fold, OCT shows nothing other than uh, you basically get a, a water line of RPE defect uh, through the fovea and patients find that very symptomatic. Um, I think all these techniques have pros and cons. I think in those particular uh, cases, I do like perfluorocarbon liquid. I probably would put that patient face down and do everything I can to minimize uh, the, the anatomy uh, being something other than normal. It will never be normal, but uh, obviously our, our goal is to get it as anatomically perfect as possible. But you're right, it's, it's very challenging. Uh, we, it, I've heard people, remember in the past, used to say, oh, try to let the detachment progress more. Uh, they'd be less symptomatic, but I, I wouldn't wait uh, to go to the R. That's, that's something I wouldn't have. Tom, can I have a question? Please? Yes, please. Would uh, you, I would like, okay. Go I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Would you detach the form, more than uh, four during the, the fluid air exchange, all the fluid down, you detach more than four and then for carbon liquid, then you remove more. I've, I've heard that advocated. It's not something I purposely do. Mm -hmm. uh, just a question, Am. Yes, please. For carbon, please, I want to ask you about subfoveal perfluorocarbon management. Uh, some, some doctors try to uh, detach the macula and displace it, and some directly use 41 gauge needle and inserting inside the bubble and aspirate it. I found this is the best way because sometimes, if it is long standing, it becomes encapsulated and it is never be displaced. Uh, do you think this is the best way to remove it or what's your best way to remove soft foveal perfluorocarbon? Uh, uh, well, uh, believe it or not, I, I agree with you. And that's based on an N of two. Um, uh, I've tried uh, detaching the macula and when I tried to do that, the bubble came right out through the fovea anyways. Um, and so first and foremost, as you mentioned, the encapsulation process and lack of good recovery or challenges to remove it. Uh, if it does, if you do see it, I try to go in within two to three weeks, just enough time for get some um, adhesion of my pexy along the brakes so I don't get redetachment. But um, um, I try to go in soon. It, that's what I would advocate. Um, fortunately, knock on wood, and I think it's because of what I've learned through the years and what other people have shared in uh, nice venues like this that uh, we've all learned to minimize the complications of that happening. But I agree with you, 41 gauge directly over the fovea, you create a small defect, closes beautifully. I, I've done it, yes. and the macular anatomy can look pristine. Thank okay. you. We, we have a question from the audience. Does anyone use PFCL uh, as a tamponading agent? I do not. No. Okay. Yeah, and Carlos then... mentioned earlier that the problems you get into with dispersion if left in the eye after a while, inflammatory reaction. Some of my associates in, in the United States, others have advocated. Um, I, I don't see the need and he's right, you need it, Carlos is right, you need it for more than a few weeks if you're gonna want to do that. So um, in PVR, I'm doing large inferior retinectomies I, and I think you can get adequate tamponade even with regular oil. We don't have a choice in the United States, we don't have heavy oil. Okay. Now I'd like to invite Professor Tarek Hassan. He's going to speak about how to flatten your retina with drainage through the break or air with retinotomy. Uh, Dr. Tarek, go ahead.
Unmute, please. Unmute. Dr. Tarek. There you we go. Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, okay. And let me. Can you see my desktop? Yeah. Everything is perfect. perfect. Okay. So to, thank you, uh, all of you, for inviting me to be on with, with uh, such a wonderful group and talking about some very interesting things. And we're going to talk a little bit more about basic techniques. And I like my placement after Carl's talk because it does uh, go along with some of the things he said, and, and there may be some differences as well. So I'm going to talk about draining through the peripheral break or making a retinotomy. Certainly, you know, when we talk about retinal detachment repair, we always have to keep in mind that our goal is indeed to reattach the retina. And, and when we take a patient to the operating room, of course, we, we find and we treat all the breaks, but we actually want to reattach the retina, or at least I do, while we're in the operating room. And some people, so if you really basically divide it, you have people that try to dry every little bit of fluid. And, and as Carlos said, there is no way you get it all out but you get it out as much as you can convince yourself that it's really flat. And you do that while you're in the operating room. And that's where we get into our drainage techniques of many different ways. And there are some, and I think there are still some, who don't mind leaving some fluid and doing non-drainage procedures, whether they be scleral buckles or during the case of a vitrectomy where they're not able to get much of the fluid out of the macula. And they assume that the RPE pump will get rid of the subretinal fluid. And when you look at non-drainage procedures, historically, the results are pretty good, actually. And there are papers out there that actually would even suggest that the visual acuity outcomes may be comparable to draining a, uh, some of the uh, retina flat. But I think that is mostly historical. Here's an interesting OCT, and I don't know how well you see it. This is a patient that was sent to me just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this here is in the macula. It's a pocket of subretinal fluid that you can see on OCT in a procedure that, a vitrectomy done by someone in the area who did not completely drain the fluid from the macula. And in fact, this is now three to four weeks later and these pockets of fluid have not changed a single bit and they've been examined over time. I'm sure it will, but again, just to emphasize the fact that if you leave the fluid there and you happen to be in the operating room, sometimes it doesn't go away and can be very symptomatic. I think today, with our improved techniques and equipment and training, there are a lot fewer non-drainage procedures that are being done. So my bias is to drain the retina dry in the operating room uh, as long as it's safely achievable. So for successful retinal detachment repair, someone had mentioned earlier, you have to separate the posterior hyoid as completely as you can certainly around the breaks, but hopefully across the entire retinal surface as much as possible out to the anterior vitreous space to relieve all traction, to lessen the likelihood of PVR, and hopefully you will indeed find all the breaks. So non-drainage is, is a last resort. There are people who are describing techniques of external drainage of subretinal fluid while internally visualizing at the scope. So they do have a trectomy and then they cut down from the sclera and externally drain. Personally, I'm not sure why I would ever do that. I'm not sure if anyone on the panel has any experience and they can share that with us if they, they do. I don't necessarily see the benefit of that, so I'm going to dismiss that as well. We talk really about internal drainage of subretinal fluid. So liquid perfluorocarbon, as Carl said, rolls the retina flat. It, it presses the retina into place. An air fluid exchange settles the retina or allows the retina to go back into place and we exchange the fluid in the vitreous cavity for air. We can drain directly from the break, we can drain through a posterior retinotomy, or we can do a combination of any of these techniques. So my first choice method is to drain from the peripheral break. And I think uh, I saw Carl's a uh, one-third, one-third, one-third. I think mine is, is less than that. I, I think I rarely use perfluorocarbon liquid on, on a primary detachment. In fact, it's probably 5% maybe that I will ever use liquid perfluorocarbon on a primary detachment, maybe less. With PVR, maybe more because there is contraction tight retina. But if there's no PVR, there's no remaining surface traction. So you've removed whatever is there and there's no tremendous foreshortening of the retina. It's freely mobile. Uh, the, re the peripheral break is reasonably easily accessible moderate size, uh, then I do like to trim the anterior flap and attempt a fluid air exchange. 
but but I do that only after I do a fluid fluid exchange. And I really think that that's a very important part. When you start draining subretinal fluid before going to air, I like to spend a minute to try to drain the fluid through the brake while still under fluid. You tilt the eye as far as possible over in the direction of the brake and just keep draining with a soft tip or even the cutter at the posterior edge of the brake. And then I like to go to air. Usually by, by, by that time, I've reduced the subretinal fluid somewhat. And then I just go back and forth between the edge of the brake and posteriorly towards the optic nerve area. And I keep the eye turned towards the brake until I can see the fluid air, the air fluid level well posterior to the level of the brake, like two or three disc diameters. So often you have the eye tilted and your soft tip may even be coming in at an angle while you can clearly visualize that the, the water level is posterior so that when you return the, the eye to its shape, uh, its uh, primary position, you're well, well below the edge of the brake. So here is just a very a quick video of draining from a peripheral brake and again, it's all about removing all of the uh, hyaloids. And here's the fluid-fluid exchange. And you can see how much drainage I can get by just doing it under fluid first. Like to mark the edge of the tear. In this case, uh, we had a difficult cornea, so there's a lot more marking than I, I usually will just mark the edge, maybe the most posterior and anterior edge of the brake so I can see it. And then uh, still, all of this is, is largely done under fluid. And now the air comes in and a, and a lot of my uh, work has already been done before even having to go to air. This is another video uh, draining from a peripheral brake where uh, it's highly bullous and using the cutter under fluid, that's a fairly large brake, um, you can aspirate. And, and there, if, if you notice, if you orient the cutter anteriorly, the, the anterior flap has already been cut and you have a large bullous attachment. You can actually very gently and softly and without trauma use the back of the cutter to just elevate the posterior lip a little, little bit there and help with drainage. And uh, you can get this uh, down quite substantially. And then at the end, if you would like to use a soft tip to finish it, if you haven't gotten all the fluid, you can. But you can see in this case, um, the cutter can be used quite nicely as well, keeping the eye turned to that side. And then you go back to the center. So I think that either instrument is fine, but it doesn't always work. And so you have to do a posterior drainage retinotomy. I actually love posterior drainage retinotomies. I think there is a tremendous role still for them. And I, I think I, I, I find it to be atraumatic and in many ways less uh, involved in than using liquid perfluorocarbon, for example, if you're having trouble with small breaks in the far periphery with significant subretinal fluid, or if you have a chronic detachment with very viscous subretinal fluid. Maybe you've actually done a drainage from a peripheral break and you still have large pockets of fluid often near the posterior pole. Um, or as Carlos was mentioning earlier, we really want to avoid macular folds because we don't want to leave much fluid there. And, and hope that the uh, RPE pump can clear everything and hope that the patient maintains a face down position. So I really like to try to get the macula as dry as possible. I look for a safe access and the best region is definitely nasal or superior. And maybe if you can get out at the equator level it is ideal. But I love retinotomies because they can be done very elegantly and they can be done fairly small. Certainly, we have to make sure that these eyes have no PVR or remaining surface traction. A freely mobile retina is better. And when the, you, know, you have peripheral breaks that are small, you you've got to find a point where you think you can either access immediately or bring the fluid over where there's enough at that site that as soon as you start draining through that small retinotomy, it doesn't close. So you know, I try to go outside the macular or the arcade vessels make a very small diathermy mark, take a soft tip cannula, and under passive aspiration, so no active aspiration, I put that right in the center of my little diathermy spot, and then slowly turn on my aspiration, which then allows you to unroof that area specifically there 
without making your retinotomy very large. Then once you start aspirating, you want to do it slow and steady to keep the flow of the subretinal fluid going, preferably without stops and starts. You know, the, obviously, subretinal fluid is somewhat viscous, so it, wa it wants to stay together by its nature. And you want to keep it together so that you don't, if you have a lot of quick aspiration and then it stops, sometimes the flap of your retinotomy will close and you'll trap fluid. So slow, steady aspiration allows the viscous subretinal fluid to come together. And again, I start with the fluid-fluid drainage. You can remove substantial subretinal fluid that way, and you change the architecture of the retina from being bullous in a convex fashion to a concave fashion as the retina is settled. And that assumes much closer to the position that you want the retina to end up when you then go to air and you get better flattening um, at, at that point. And, it, and, and then, of course, I like to uh, prefer to laser the, ret the posterior drainage retinotomy. I have seen some papers where people do not laser their retinotomy. I could certainly see that if you had an inadvertent one or you made one very close to the macula. But I think if you're far enough away from the macula and you're sort of gentle in your laser, you can avoid you know, scarring uh, complications and still uh, do a laser procedure as, at that site. So here is just a, uh, a video of uh, so the way I do this. Um, certainly get, make sure you get all the traction of the anterior vitreous base. Identify an area, this is fortunately nasal. Make a small diathermy mark. And then with uh, soft tip cannula, go directly into the middle before I begin aspirating so that I can limit the size of it. Obviously your diathermy makes that retina very atrophic, but if you stay right in the middle, this usually it unroofs a little easier than this, but this one didn't want it to immediately. But then as soon as we go to fluid and doing this aspiration fluid-fluid exchange, we change the architecture of the retina quite significantly. And if you wait long enough, you know, which at this point, some people may already get tired of just trying this, but I just kept going under fluid and you can see, you can drain this quite extensively. And by the time I decide to go to air, I have it mostly dry already. So I, it's, this, it's all the way this flat before I decided to introduce air. And uh, then you just do a very simple uh, completion of that step. And then, of course, you want to go back and forth between your retinotomy site and the uh, optic nerve area as you do when draining a peripheral retinal break. Again, you can see it's a very small little site, and you don't really cause much trauma by doing that. One of the reasons I like retinotomies and retinectomies so much is because of the concept of intrinsic retinal foreshortening. We know that we all see cases where you go into an eye, you do not see any PVR on the surface above, you don't see PVR underneath, but the, the retina is actually shrunken from what it was. The mobile elastic retinal surface is reduced. So the retina is really too small to comfortably lay flat against the the retinal, the, the back of the eye wall. So it's independent of fibrous tissue. So we know histologically, and there's some excellent studies, which I did not include here, where we see fibro, fibro, we see glial proliferation of fibrous tissue growth within the retina that begins as early as 12 to 24 hours after the retina is detached. And by one to two days after a retina is detached, you will see significant glial proliferation within the retina, not only in the detached retina, but actually in non-detached retina that can be up to several clock hours away. So we know that the concept of intrinsic retinal foreshortening is happening right at the onset of a detached retina. And I think that that contributes to some of the failures that we can't explain, where we think we've made sure we removed all the highlight or we removed all the traction, and yet the retina may redetach. So I do, somewhat along the lines of what Carl described, what I call a limited retinotomy slash retinectomy at the time of the repair, where I do enlarge that peripheral break. If I find a peripheral break that I can access, it's more than just trimming the anterior flap. I try to enlarge the break at least 1.5 times. Maybe I don't double the break, but I, 
enlarge it reasonably generously. And I'll try to do it anteriorly, but I'll also like to do it more radially, uh, laterally, either side, prior to the airfluid exchange. Because as just as it helps to drain when you're using perfluorocarbon, it really helps you a lot when you're trying to drain under air. So it allows the drainage and what is essentially prophylactic treatment of whatever retinal core shortening there is. Because I'm often surprised that when I do this, and then I flatten the retina, that area is a lot bigger than I thought it would be, even in eyes that don't have any obvious PVR. And it allows for the retina to go back in a very relaxed manner. So this is just one case of, of such a thing where um, identify the break and uh, after marking it, I enlarge it more in the horizontal meridian. And I'll advance that. I mark it, and then I, I mark it a little bit. You can see it's at least one and a half times more. I'm going to cut it uh, in that meridian. And all of a sudden, the fluid drains quickly as soon as I do that. And I enlarge it just a little bit more, then do it, the air fluid exchange and laser. And again, I think you're achieving much more than just relieving vitreous from the flap. I like to do drainage uh, under air. Uh, over PFO in most cases, you certainly avoid the high cost of liquid perfluorocarbon, which exists probably everywhere, certainly in the United States. I do like the idea of avoiding leaving residual perfluorocarbon bubbles behind. And I like, avoid, I like to avoid being misled that I've relieved all the traction, even tangentially, tangentially when I use PFO. PFO can flatten anything. It'll, if you leave traction behind, perfluorocarbon will flatten the retina anyway. When you take it away and later down the road, you may be misled and you think that you removed a lot of traction. So I certainly like to drain under air if I can. And it's also the reason why I don't like a direct PFO silicone exchange as we were talking about earlier. As was mentioned, I like to go to air in between because you can see if you've left some traction uh, forces behind on the retina. And I'm doing a retinotomy, retinectomy allows the opportunity to to relax that retina and reduce the impact of that. Obviously, there are many ways to successfully manage subretinal fluid. I think surgeons need to understand all the possible options and they need to try to choose the safest method for each eye and use techniques that are most comfortable for each surgeon and the methods that really most comprehensively manage the retinal pathology. I think we all have to consider factors that determine which techniques are better for which situations including ones that aren't obvious, like invisible intrinsic foreshortening of the retina or really shallow fluid in the fovea, like Carlos mentioned, and certainly the cost per case. So I thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hassan. Uh, any questions? Just I think somebody, somebody in the audience, uh, Dr. Sharaki, sent a question. He's saying that uh, removal of subretinal fluid uh, we're clear that you don't have to really dry the retina. What are, what are your opinion about this? What's your opinion about this? Well, first of all, I, I think that it is true in, in some cases, although not, at, not in every case, or you don't know how long it will clear in every case. So I showed you a case where it didn't clear and the, and the person actually thought they had dried the fluid. Imagine if that same individual, that same detached retina had no drainage. I think you don't always know that. And I think obviously, as you, while you have a detached retina, you promote further glial proliferation. Again, remember the intrinsic foreshortening concept. One to two days after a retina is not appositional to the RPE, you have all of this fibrous proliferation started. If you look at some of the literature that looks at this histologically, by seven to 10 days, you have you have looks like a weeds in a garden growing through the retinal tissue of all the glial tissue. So the longer you're detached, it's going to keep happening that way, and that obviously has uh, ramifications for your long-term visual acuity and long-term possibility of PVR. So I worry about all of those things happening certainly and and, and uh, becoming a problem. So I like I like I like to drain it flat. I know it can in many cases dry on its own but I don't like to wait for it because it's, that's a gamble I don't need to take. I can, I can flatten it in the, in the OR.
Okay, uh, what if the patient is high myopia and is having a posterior cephaloma, say a macular detachment? How do, what do you do for this to flatten his retina? We need uh, the audience to know the steps. Uh, asking me or asking the audience? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking you, Tariq. Oh, well, I mean, I certainly try to employ the same, the same strategies. I do think if you have deep staphylomatous uh, detachment, certainly that is when you look at things like the fluorocarbon, if you feel you can see well enough to get it out. There are many, re many reasons to use liquid perfluorocarbon. It's all about visualization, about the safety with which you can approach these uh, pathologies. And there are instances, even when you feel like you must leave some fluid if you've treated the breaks and have taken, taken good care of it. So I wouldn't rule out any technique, particularly in more complicated detachments like a deep macular staphylomatous type case. But, um, so, but I, I don't think I would abandon my principles in that case as well. Okay, um, does anybody have something question. different that he uses uh, when dealing with a highly myopic, deeply staphylomatous uh, detachment? I have a question for Dr. Tarek, please. Go ahead, Dr. Okay, please, Dr. Tarek, I do the same. Uh, I, I really use berfluorocarbon only for joint retinitis and BVR with penotomies. I, I always drain through the tear and uh, I do uh, uh, drainage autotomy, equatorial, small, and very faint laser around. I, I don't have any fibrosis or refreshing from it, actually. Uh, but I just want a question. What's uh, the age of the patient below which you don't do drainage autotomy? Because you know, in young age, sometimes the refreshing is severe. And uh, so you have an age limit below which you don't do drainage autotomy. I don't do below 20, for example, for me, but uh, due to my bad experience with one case. So uh, I want to ask you about this question. Well, it's a, it's a very good question. I, I will admit I, don't, I do not have an age cutoff. And I think that uh, for the most part, how you handle the tissue really determines the level of safety in these cases. So I, I think a younger person can certainly have a drainage retinotomy if you've removed the posterior hyaloid, that you're very comfortable that you remove the hyaloid. Obviously, the younger they are, the harder it is to get a complete hyaloidal separation. So I, sir, I don't want to make a retinotomy if I've left hyaloid in that location. Yeah, of, course, of course, of course. But if I am very comfortable that I did, um, I have no age limit really. I mean, I certainly don't like to make extra holes in the retina in children. So maybe, yes. you know, if you're eight, nine, 10, I'm, I'm getting more and more and more nervous. But, but certainly um, a 15 year old, 20 year old, if the pathology has been treated and the tissue is being handled delicately like you described, it, described it perfectly, I'm not so concerned in those, in those instances. Tariq, I have one question for you. Uh, one of the advantages to use uh, perfluorocarbon liquid in this, you know, retinal detachment, one of the, you, you didn't mention is to maintain the retina attached when you are trimming the vitreous base or the, the peripheral vitreous or to, or to remove the posterior hyaluron to the periphery. Then under air, I do under air vitreotomy, but you know, not that easy. Then, then how you manage this? You, do you think you can complete the same the vitreotomy with or without perfluorocarbon liquid? Well, yes, yes, I do. I, I think it depends somewhat on your operating situation. It is certainly easier to do that well of a vitrectomy if you have a skilled assistant doing peripheral depressed exam, uh, depression while you are doing your cutting, because usually if you're doing enough peripheral depression, uh, that bolus fluid uh, becomes much less bolus as you're doing it because the fluid escapes out of the, out of the break. Um, but it is an excellent point that you bring that there is a, a, a role for perfluorocarbon for sure in many, many cases. And, and I use it too for exactly the reason you just mentioned. I just think it's not very common anymore. In, in most instances, uh, very rare, 5% of primary detachments maybe would I really use it. And, and I would use it, for, for example, for the reason you just stated. You, I use it much more frequently in PVR cases, of course, but uh, in just managing uh, mobile retina, uh, as we talk, as we discussed. May I have a question, please, to Dr. Tarek? 
Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, please, uh, Dr. Tarek, in a high myopic patient uh, with extensive chorioretinal degeneration, I'm asking about the posterior retinotomy, how to identify and how difficult you are going to laser this retinotomy. Yeah, it's very, it's very difficult. So that's what I was saying before. I think if you have um, such uh, whitening of the tissue where you really can't, and such atrophic thin retina in the posterior, uh, within the staphyloma, then say the staphyloma comes all the way to the equator. Yes, I would try to avoid making it. I would not want to make a retinotomy in those cases. Only if you you have to see it, of course. So even diathermy can be difficult to allow you to see it. So those are the cases I would probably avoid trying to make a posterior drainage retinotomy. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tarek. Now we, we go Thank to the, Dr. Noura Kar. Uh, she's going to be speaking to us about chromovitrectomy. Uh, go ahead, Noor. Uh, can start you. sharing your screen now. Please can you stop sharing? Stop sharing. Uh, Tarek, uh, please stop, stop sharing. Screen. Stop sharing. You know, screen. I'm trying. I thought uh, that that was. <laughs> I thought that was the problem. I'm trying to, but I can't. I've I've lost the uh, the everyone's the, the. I can't see my own screen. Oh. Okay. To see what I'm sharing. How do I do that, you guys? Uh, you have a. I think you should. Do you see this uh, red button? No, no, from, I about, don't. I only from, see. I only see. I only see Zoom. I don't see. I don't even see my presentation. Okay. Can you see it's your very strange. Okay. I only okay. see the top. Uh huh. Or top anyone? Who's right? Just top. make enlarge the screen, then it comes all the way. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I think you should enlarge your screen now. Uh huh. No, no, no. Yeah, that's, uh, a bit more to the left. A bit more to here, the left. Here, I, I, you know, I found. Well, I still haven't seen you, but I can stop share now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nurakar is going to speak about yeah. Kromovich. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. It's my uh, pleasure to be here with this distinguished faculty. It's an honor and my great pleasure. And thank you for the nice invitation. So yeah. I'm just uh, opening my. Okay, it's chroma vitrectomy. Um, I have no financial disclosures. So indication, chroma vitrectomy means that using vital dyes to aid visualization of the semi-transparent ocular tissues. And which are those tissues? So chroma means a color, so it's like a colorful vitrectomy. Uh, vitreous, uh, sometimes it is, we can see the vitreous in most of the cases, uh, even if it is condensed or if, if it uh, 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 contains some blood. But apart from it, we, we may use it to ensure that we remove the posterior hyaluroid and to do a more complete vitrectomy. And for the apparatal membranes, uh, they are again semi-translucent and we do it in macular membranes and also PVR and even some diabetic uh, tractional membranes. And the internal limiting membrane, I think it's the most difficult one. It's very thin, but uh, we, can, we, uh, we have to peel it in the holes, apparatal membranes again, some PVR cases and uh, et cetera. So it's just briefly, I will go to these slides. Uh, the ideal diet should be, of course, the first measure should be safe and non-toxic uh, and pH balance and only isosmolar uh, diets should be used. And it should sufficiently stain the target tissue or the tissues uh, we aim. Easily visible and ready to use for the surgeon. It's really preferable all the time. And when used appropriately, it is really available tool for the uh, vitreoretinal surgeon. I have to just mention that because I have read some case reports, uh, Depomedroid contains methylprednisolone acetate and designed to use in perioculary actually. But uh, if it is intentional or unintentionally injected into the vitreous, the preservative is really very highly toxic. So it causes retinal necrosis. So we should always abandon uh, this agent. Benzene alcohol, on the other hand, the common preservative found in uh, triamcinone acetonide, including Kenalog and uh, others. But the toxicity data is still uh, not so clear that the concentration found in the commercial formulation is, uh, does not harm the retina, uh, the reports say it like that. So the surgical technique, how do we inject it intravitreally? Whenever I inject uh, something into the eye, especially now we use valve canal, so it's a closed system, I close the infusion. For example, including the heavy liquids, I close the infusion. It's, it's because you can increase the pressure and if there's, there's not a total vitrectomy, especially there's vitreous in the periphery, 
in the near to the cannula, when you inject into and the always infusion pressure, we should be uh, careful about the level. And all the vitreous can plug into the cannula. So the next next step you get into the uh, vitreous, you may make a peripheral tear even. The cannulas protect the peripheral retina, but it's still an um, um, risk. And uh, check if the cannula is attached well, uh, no matter who give it to you, even your experienced uh, nurse. I always check that the cannula is attached and there is no air in the injector. I always inject a small amount just outside the eye, feeling the smoothness of the cannula, especially if it is not ready to use, but you prepare something with the dilution or something like that. And always we should gently inject, as already mentioned, a slowly injection, avoiding jet stream. Uh, we can do it under partial air exchange to concentrate the dye in the macular area or uh, to the area to be stained or on the fluid. But if you do it on the fluid, it, is, uh, it will be diluted and maybe less staining. So uh, the problem to solve it, we can make it like a heavy solution, heavy suspension mixing with glucose solution or ready to use like uh, heavy dyes we have at hand. So uh, it gives us comfort. I'm waiting for around one minute and then wash out all the dye uh, we inject into the eye and then we can re-inject if necessary or confirm the ILM peeling for example we can re-inject the dye. So about the vitreous, tramsinone acetonite is the best uh, non-soluble corticosteroid to stain the vitreous. The white crystal actually doesn't stain but bind evidently to the acellular vitreous and also they deposit on the ILM that we used to peel the ILM uh, with those deposits uh, long before. So uh, we have some compounds in Turkey, in Europe, and also in the USA, there are compounds which are preservative free. We don't have these uh, in our countries. And typically injecting, uh, I, I usually, I always dilute it like five times because the particles are really very condensed, dense enough uh, to inject it directly. I dilute it five times in the injector and maybe for the ILM, we used to dilute it at least uh, 10 times. So typically injecting small amount that is needed. I, I like to present some cases regarding this. This is a young uh, patient, like 37 years old, post-traumatic macular hole with a choroidal rupture. And we start the vitrectomy. We have to do some core vitrectomy, uh, create some space to inject the, uh, the uh, triamcinolone. And also you can see there's a partial uh, tractions in the mid periphery. So here I inject the dye, I inject the triamcinolone with the infusion closed, so it sinks in on top of the uh, macula, the posterior pole, and then when you open, when you get into and open the, vitre open the uh, infusion again, they are dispersed, we clean the, all the dyes, and whenever it is, uh, it, uh, it is deposited on, the, on top of the retina, there you can understand that there is vitreous there. So it's a, it's a cue for us to, that we may leave uh, vitreous or not. So with the standard technique, as already mentioned, I think I don't like to just aspirate all the vitreous when I touch around the optic nerve into the mid periphery or, I'm sorry, to the, uh, to the above. But, um, but uh, going by sector and sector to, uh, to leave some, uh, some level, for example, from one quadrant and then letting the infusion fluid uh, getting underneath the portion that you leave, uh, you, uh, you already left and then uh, it, is, uh, it is done easily, especially in pediatric cases, or it's, it's, this is a young guy, for example, you can see that the connections are still um, uh, hard. Uh, so this, this helps to protect any tears formation. So the next stage, uh, next video is uh, again a pediatric case. For example, this one, they are really very uh, strongly attached. You just, it also really helps to really helps to delineate the uh, vitreous in these cases. And we can, uh, with the aspiration, we can uh, uh, remove on at some stage and then we should, for example, in this stage, go for the heavy liquid into the center and, and then going uh, smoothly cleaning the vitreous until to the periphery. So this is uh, a rapid rectomized eyes. Again, it's an eight-year-old, a young a pediatric uh, case highly myopic with congenital glaucoma, aphasia. And here also we can use the with transferolone to make a complete vitrectomy, peripheric vitrectomy. And as it is uh, revitrectomized, I always check again with the transferolone just to see if the posterior hyaluronic is really 
uh, is really uh, at a weighted commute. Uh, sometimes it is not. Uh, we have to con control that. And sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, I think it's stuck. I think, I think you should uh, use your mouse again on the screen. Okay, sorry. I'm pressing something more. And then um, going to the periphery here, I was going to show, checking the, uh, and then with the uh, rolling maneuver, for example, the vitreous, the periphery vitreous is really shown very good with the tramcinolone. And then you can, with using some instruments, not in all cases, but this case uh, it was doable. Uh, leaving, uh, lifting the uh, perfect vitreous left, and then again seeing more clearly, we can with the peristaltic. We have a really good equipment with jet turbine machines uh, at hand. We can work uh, to the retina very closely, even also with the indentation going and uh, doing the more complete vitrectomy in this pediatric uh, case. So tripan blue is the second dye, uh, which is really uh, only able to stain the dead cells and, uh, and is ideal for the epiretinal membrane. 0.15 is the concentration which stains the epiretinal membrane very well. And uh, membrane blue, we had it in the past. It was, we should, uh, we should do it under air or again, mixing with the glucose solution, we can have a dense solution to sink uh, on top of the retina. So that is the partial air exchange done. It's a bit older video. So we inject very uh, gently again to the macula underneath the, uh, underneath the um, air and uh, continue that you can see that the membrane is stained well and we continue the peeling. So brilliant blue is a really uh, nice dye for the internal limiting membrane. It has strong affinity for the basal membranes of the collagen, and the concentration is much less, 0.025. It's the of smaller, and uh, most emitter and vitreous studies show no retinal toxicity. But we shouldn't leave it, we should avoid leaving it subretinal in case there is a tear and we leave it. We cannot clean it, uh, it causes atrophic changes. Uh, there, there is some uh, preparations like brilliant peel in Europe and brilliant blue or ILM blue in uh, USA or in our country, combined with a carrier polyethylene glycol, which makes a compound denser and then it just sinks uh, on top of the macula that you uh, would like to peel. And the combination of these two dyes is an ideal one. I really like it. Uh, I, this is my preference whenever I peel not only ILM, but any kind of membranes, PBR or some severe diabetic or uh, epiretinal membranes. So it's a combination, the usual combination, and it has been shown that two, chemi two uh, molecules do not react chemically and they can stay uh, stained the uh, two tissues very well. So again, it's, it is available uh, in the uh, heavy forms. So this is an example for the brilliant blue for the ILM peel. That is the first case that we uh, already posted highlight is removed. So this is, if you can see, it's a light, uh, a light blue and it is readily uh, staining the ILM. I always, this is my preference, uh, but I like to work uh, at the back of the, with the contact lenses because it's the depth of uh, focus and my resolution, I feel I'm used to that. So uh, you can see how uh, beautifully it stains the uh, internal limiting membrane. It's just uh, sinks to the macula, and I wait for some, uh, usually a minute, and I close the infusion while I'm waiting because I use the trocars, uh, valve trocars, valve cannulas. It is usually doable again. Uh, and going uh, like a capsule, doing a capsule excess, it is not attached so tightly, although this patient is a young patient. We can feel that it is gently peeled. Uh, and of course, whenever we, uh, we work in the uh, macula, we of course check the retinal right periphery all uh, 360 degrees. And Again, tramcinolone gives you the opportunity to see the periphery first better. So this is uh, ending with the gas. That's another young patient. Uh, I have to stop because that's a nice, you can see this white ring here. And it's although she's young, myopic uh, eye, the uh, vitreous is already detached and with a really thick and membrane with a lot of metamorphopsia. So you can see that the uh, tramcinolone again sinks. We start with the tramcinolone just to control if it is really uh, detached, and then inject again, uh, closing the infusion.
fusion the dye, it will sink on, uh, on, on top of the macula. And uh, the, the steps are the same. We go, I always, uh, with again, macular. Uh, but this one, uh, I start for the ILM, I peel with the, of course, internal limiting membrane for steps, but apparatal membranes, jaws for steps are much more uh, powerful. So, and in this case, this is, you can feel that it is a bit adherent because it is coming with the internal limiting membrane. It is adherent to the internal limiting membrane. And usually at this stage, I can feel that I peel the ILM already. But of course, this, she's a young uh, person and I have to confirm that if I peel it really. Uh, so this is when I inject the dye infusion close, these hemorrhages occur from the internal limiting membrane peel and it's an un indirect sign that you peeled at those areas. So I enlarge my uh, internal limiting membrane peeling and check the periphery, she's a myopic eye, and close the case. So this is uh, an example is a pediatric age again uh, with a PVR redetachment. With the PVR is 180 degrees as you can see all the retinectomy area just uh, uh, with the PVR constricted. So I inject Tramcellon, but uh, again, these dual membranes uh, gives you really comfort because I would like to peel the ILM in this case. The, uh, the apparatal membranes with the jaws forceps easily can be renewed, but uh, whenever I peel with the, in this case, uh, the pediatric ages, really ILM is stuck very uh, adherently. So uh, I just make a one pinch before I inject the li liquid and then uh, putting the heavy liquid and then going from that side, uh, moving forward and trying to complete, uh, to peel the ILM at least in the macula and whenever, uh, wherever I can between the arcades. So it, in these cases, as you can see, this is uh, um, uh, dyed beautifully. You can see that if, if, if I cannot have the stain, I, I think I would really <laughs> like to be, to be a retinal tear. So as you can see, it is, you, uh, you, we, don't, we don't like to, make any traction uh, enter posteriorly, but uh, as it is really uh, adherent, so we have to be uh, trying not to peel like, again, like a capsule rexus maneuver, holding the uh, peeled membrane on top of the rest and going uh, from this side, moving from this side. So this is done. And at the end, you can see that the retina is relaxed at this after ILM peel. This is an example for I don't know if I have time, but just to, say, uh, just to serve a diabetic patient, a young guy, uh, type one only seeing eye, it is really very adherent all around the uh, retina, no laser, and it is active bleeding. So I would like to peel a uh, dye with a membrane in this case. And then the, the, the scissors uh, that I mentioned, because I need to do it, it is diffused adherent in this case. You start, at, you can readily peel little fine because the membranes are stained with the blue stain, but the vitreous not. So it's kind of a negative stain now for the vitreous. So you can, again, feel that uh, um, uh, this is the vitreous actually. And sometimes even there are some connections in the mid periphery going to the periphery. And dying in these cases gives you more confidence. Uh, this is my last video and just to show an example for the negative staining. So this is again a young, uh, considered young patient, ischemic retinopathy and uh, with a partial uh, vitreous detachment, vitreous hemorrhage and the lamellar macular hole. So we inject triamcinolone. So you can see readily that there are some triamcinolone deposits on, on top of the macula. So it's a sign that uh, we may leave there's some vitreous in the macula. There's a little lamella, of course. I try to uh, clean and also I, I uh, and the retina, the vitreous is detached the, per the periphery, but uh, I check the mac from the optic disc always that I even, um, there's still some vitreous lamella that can be aspirated or if I, there's anything left, uh, checking the periphery. So dying for the uh, ILM peeling, as you can see, I, I think that I will be peeling the internal limiting membrane, but as you can feel, that, that is the feeling also. It is not the consistency of the internal limiting membrane. So, and it is not staying so well. You can see some trimcinolone particles already. So, it's a sign for that there is a, a lamella of vitreous kaisers on top of the macula. So, Joe's forceps is really more powerful to peel this uh, uh, vitreous residual vitreous, and then with secondary dyeing, uh, we can peel the internal limiting membrane as usual. So in diabetic eyes or diabetic uh, retinopathy eyes, 
young guys, especially myopic guys, and pediatric guys, there we should be always be alert for the vitreous cases and act accordingly. In Yosemite Green and Infrasin Green, I have some slides, but as uh, as the first starting from the first report, uh, starting maybe 2003, about its toxicity. Actually, I never used it since then. And uh, uh, it, the, uh, there is uh, those dependent uh, of toxicity in, to the retina and retina pigment epithelial cells. There are some meta analysis for that and also animal studies. Um, you, uh, US colleagues, uh, my colleagues in the United States can be more uh, experienced using these dyes because uh, brilliant UG was not FDA approved uh, until recently, but uh, it should be either or smaller, the duration should be really minimal. Uh, what we did at those uh, years, we just used the diluted tramcinolone to kill the eye. And uh, I think this is my last slide. Uh, take home messages. Uh, whenever I peel the ILM, I, I pick brilliant blue is the ideal. But apart from it is the combo or the dual dye is really very effective and uh, reasonable. And we should be cautious about the amount injected, the duration, if we dilute, for example, tramcinolone with a preservative, uh, and the duration as short as possible, we, uh, we try to do it. Follow the injection principles. It's a very valuable tool for the VR surgeon. Uh, thank you for your uh, kind attention. Thank you very much, Noura. And I would have to praise you on your camera. You have a very nice camera, by the way. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, last but not least, I, I would like to call Professor uh, Ashraf Sharawi. He's going to present problem solving from the experts. Unmute, please, Dr. Ash. Okay. Now, okay. anybody <clears throat> can unmute, please. Everybody should unmute so that we can have a discussion. Okay. Uh, actually, it's it's my pleasure uh, this evening, as a part of the Alexandria Retina Training School, to be sharing with this very distinguished uh, panel uh, about the basics of vitrectomy, and I hope that we will be able to repeat uh, this uh, panel soon, uh, uh, in a way or another, in another topic. I'm going to show. Uh, one, some of the cases that I face, and I will ask the panel about the idea about the way I had uh, dealt with these cases. This is a, a, a case of subtotal retinal detachment with uh, upper and lower nasal breaks. Uh, the patient has some posterior subcapsular cataract, uh, and I decided not to remove the cataract on the first setting. And this was the vitreous surgery. And as you can see, this is a down and nasal uh, flap tear and an upper nasal flap tear doing fluid to fluid exchange, trying to drain part of the retinal, subretinal fluid and to flatten the retina, staining of the vitreous and removal of the posterior hyaloid. I tried to drain the subretinal fluid through the break by tilting. The, uh, the globe towards the break, and again using by manual surgery to depress the subretinal fluid towards the dredge. But, but as you can see, during the process of air fluid exchange due to the presence of the sub, uh, uh, posterior subcapsular cataract, the visualization drops to a very bad condition. And one of the most important things to do during this surgery after flattening of the retina is to apply laser to these breaks very efficiently. Otherwise, you will get problems in the post-operative period. And due to the presence of the posterior capsule, and this was a one-eyed patient, I changed the air into silicon oil. And as you can see, the laser application under silicon oil, in spite of the fact that the patient had uh, some posterior capsular cataract, which was not, uh, was, was hindering the visualization and the application of the laser during uh, air fluid exchange had changed to a crystal clear vision and this was the post-operative appearance. I would like to ask the panel about the tips and tricks. Do you do it to increase the visualization 
during the process of air fluid exchange uh, uh, step in a fecic patient with some cataract uh, formation. Okay, Dr. Rigello. We have other tricks. Dr. Rigello, do, uh, yeah. can you please start answering? Yeah, and actually, uh, you notice how much better your visualization was under oil, of course, than the air, as you mentioned. Uh, this might be a good case to consider for fluorocarbon liquid where you're working under liquid and um, and then you just need to do the perfluorocarbon air exchange adequately afterwards. But you can get all the laser that you need to get in around all the breaks under fluid with perfluorocarbon. So I would have probably chosen that. I also like to use perfluorocarbon in pseudophagic guys that have large capsulotomies because of the fogging effect that will often occur under air. Uh, those are other cases I might prefer perfluoro for the same reason, where your visualization uh, is diminished or compromised under air. Okay, Dr. Okay. Matteo? Sorry, uh, this is the great of retina surgery. You know, we, we, our opinions are so different. And Tarek, I know Tarek is, is sure that I'm going to answer. I, I would place a buckle here, buckle vitrectomy and perfluorocarbon as, uh, as Dr. Rakhio mentioned. And what very important uh, about the visualization, this is very important when you change for air, be careful with the cannula. Be careful with the cannula, don't, you know, uh, don't put the infusion of the air towards the posterior capsule because, you know, visualization in five minutes becomes terrible. Then always maintain the cannula towards the posterior part of the eye just to avoid the opacification of the posterior cannula. But I, I would use, I would use in this case, perfluorocarbon carbon liquid and abacal and only gas. Okay. Anybody Dr. can put uh, some uh, viscoelastic on the posterior surface of the uh, lens no. to clear the view? Yeah, it works well, of course, with an IOL, but for a, for a lens, it, it's a little harder because you have the opacity is intrinsic to the lens. So I don't, it might help a little, but I think it's dangerous for the lens. I, I think the other things, the, what you did or, or using for fluorocarbon seem to be a better more safe move. Okay, uh, Noor, what, what's your opinion? What would you do for this? I think I, I, think I will do the same. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, excuse me, Arm. Uh, uh, Dr. Amshusha, Mohsen, go ahead. Yes, uh, um, I think venting of the globe for a while and uh, to let uh, the peripheral carbon liquid droplet to uh, get out from the globe uh, may help and also uh, retracting the, the light to be under uh, iris and uh, avoiding reflection to your eye may help in this situation. Okay, but, but nobody would go for uh, injecting silicon oil and using uh, doing laser underneath? No, I'll do the same. Uh, actually, when I have a loudness of the lens at the end of surgery and the retina is flat. I will do the same as Dr. Ashraf Sharawi did. I, as the retina is flat and there is no fluid, I'll put the silicone. I will have better visualization and then I can do laser. Yes, I agree with Dr. Ashraf. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next case. Uh, the next case is a high myopic patient, uh, <clears throat> pseudo, um, pseudo fecic, having a posterior staphyloma and the macular hole. And it's a macular hole central detachment. Uh, after doing the vitrectomy and uh, removal of the posterior hyaloid, injection of PPG to stain the ILM and to remove it. But after the injection, the PPG had uh, escaped through the macular hole into the subretinal space. And I decided to remove the ILM in spite of that, the fact that the retina was elevated with the subretinal PPG stain under the retina. Uh, after I finished with the ILM peeling, I directly went for fluid to fluid exchange in an attempt to remove this, this subretinal stain. And I was lucky enough that through the soft tip cannula, most of the uh, stain uh, went out from its place and the subfoveal space was clear. And finally, I did air fluid exchange, flattening the retina and placing gas tamperate. Anybody would go for a, a drainage retinotomy away from the macular hole 
to drain this stain, avoiding uh, draining of the, uh, the stain through the macular hole? Um, Dr. Ashraf, I think by doing this, you're actually enlarging this hole. And most probably, this hole is surrounded by atrophic areas. I think the visual prognosis is not going to be uh, good. This is my impression. But let, me, let us ask the, the panelist, uh, Dr. Rigello, again. Uh, I would have uh, done what you did. Um, draining gently over that hole is usually um, uh, well tolerated, and I've done it for you know, detachments from macular holes and post-gestapilomas. And um, I think it works well. I think if you just do it very carefully, hover above the hole, don't engage the edges of the hole. Um, you, um, you know, like Mira was saying, a lot of times the, the visual prognosis is not great anyways because they have significant myopic degeneration. Of course, they're macular off detachment and so forth. But I would do everything the same as you did. Dye, peel the ILM, drain through the hole, providing there's no peripheral retinal break. If there's a peripheral retinal break, I actually use perfluorocarbon often uh, to get everything out. Um, and, um, and you can do that right over, right over the hole without any problems. Dr. Matteo? Well, it was a central detachment, no peripheral break, just confined yeah. to the peripheral papilloma. Right, and I would do um, what you did. Yeah. I would do what you did. You mentioned that in, so there are two types of this kind of detachment. One to the periphery, Dr. Rejillo mentioned now, and one only in the macular area, the detachment. And to remove the fluid from this is very, very, very difficult. The thing I do is totally different. I put perforocarbon liquid and the, the retina remains detached. Then you see the hole under liquid, you go with a 41 gauge cannula inside the hole. I don't try to make the fluid come to you, you enter inside and then you attach the retina because of the weight of perforocarbon liquid. And then you stain on the perforocarbon liquid and you have a perfect staining and then I do inverted flap in these cases. Okay, Mohsen? Yes, um, actually Dr. Ashraf stained under air. Um, if you are going to stain under air and before going back to fluid, please aspirate all the dye you have before turning the infusion of the fluid on. By this way, you will avoid getting the dye under the rim. Just aspirate passively by your soft tip cannula all, you all the dye you have before turning the infusion on. You will never get this problem. Okay, uh, Dr. Hassan? Yeah, you know, I, I think I would lean more to the way that you did it, uh, Ashraf, or somewhere in between. I, I don't like going inside the hole. I feel like there's a chance I may cause more damage, but going immediately over the hole, in such a case I may try, particularly if it's a bad prognosis eye. I guess I couldn't see how big it was outside of the macula. I mean, I think making a small extra macular retinotomy was, would also be an option if going over the hole wasn't working. I, I don't like to go in the hole, but maybe over the hole to drain, I would do that. Okay, Dr. Baraday. Actually, I do the same. I go to th through the hole. I don't like to go through the hole in my macular holes because it's enlarged. But in such case, you have to go, uh, I go over the hole. I try to drain as I can. But sometimes what uh, uh, controls you is the stephyloma because sometimes the stephyloma is precise to the macula. And if you're going to drain your tonotomy outside the arcade, you find that you are unable to drain the fluid. Okay, so you have to go through the hole in such case to remove the, the, uh, uh, the subretinal uh, dye. Noor, do you, do you have any other opinion? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it is uh, avoidable maybe if doing it, uh, peel, uh, dyeing it uh, in the first place under giving some maybe heavy liquid on top of the hole if it is not so convex, the staphylum I couldn't uh, see, but just closing the top of the hole as you should be sometimes, and then you can inject the dye, avoiding the, and then you wash the dye. And uh, even you make a bigger bubble on top of the hole, bigger than the hole, the periphery staining gives you, if you uh, start from the periphery, you can, uh, come to the and even peel until to the macular hole. But I agree also. I mean, if if it happened to me like this, I would be, do the same, gently removing the uh, dye like you did, Ashraf. 
and uh, Carlos Mateo is really right to uh, get into the hole because if the if the hole is not so small, you can a 41 gauge cannula uh, under perfluorocarbon. The vision is really very nice. You can just get into and suck the fluid and then uh, move forward. I think it is really a very good maneuver. Okay, next case, please. Uh, next case is a right pseudofecic uh, retinal detachment with a horseshoe break uh, almost above three o'clock on the horizontal meridian, mm -hmm. which was fixed by vitrectomy and silicon oil injection. However, the, the patient one month later developed a very nasty PVR. And as you can see, uh, after staining the posterior hyaloid, the posterior hyaloid was there. There was a new horseshoe break down and the temporal. Uh, actually, there were two, and I have to enlarge both breaks to a, a large one single inferior retinectomy. And then, uh, doing air fluid exchange, I realized that still, in spite of doing the retinectomy and enlarging, this two horseshoe, large horseshoe break into a single uh, break that the edge of these breaks are elevated and thickened. So I start to do laser around one of the breaks and I was thinking how to deal with this edge if to go uh, for uh, retinectomy under air because the, the retina was under air now and flattened under air or to return to fluid to BSS, inject PFC, and uh, uh, redo the job under PFC. However, I decided to remove or to cut this edge uh, using the, sorry. Using uh, the vitreous cutter without returning back to fluid and PFC injection. As you can see, I was shaving the edge of the retinectomy under air. There was some bleeding doing this retinectomy under air, as you are going to see while application of the laser. This was the bleeding, but the edge of the retinectomy was flattened to the eye wall and it was possible to apply heavy laser to the edge of uh, the retinectomy. Uh, I'm presenting this case to ask the panel, uh, what do you think about the two options? Dr. Okay. Mathieu. Um, let me tell you one thing. Uh, one thing is, First, this, the hyaluron was there in a mirror show before how to remove the posterior hyaluron. In some cases, you have the posterior hyaluron there, as you mentioned. Yeah. It's tough to work and do laser under air. And under air, things that happen to me is that sometimes you burn the fiber. You know, you, you are do, doing laser and the fiber begins to have smoke and, and, and disappears. Then, in this case, again, I would put a buckle. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> you know, I always say the same, but I would use a buckle because there is structure in the periphery. And I, Actually, I, there was an original buckle from the first surgery. But I, I don't see it. You know, perhaps you yeah. would tighten a little bit more. Okay. You would tighten a little bit more the buckle. Okay, uh, Dr. Hassan. You know, I think that uh, either, either way could work. And I'm not sure if you made it work. Sometimes when you cut, under air to extend the retinotomy, you really feel the relief of the traction as you do because all of a sudden it falls back and it looks like you ultimately accomplished your goal, which I think in cases like that, when you have such a large inferior break that was clearly caused by some traction, in, in my estimation, probably a lot of foreshortening of the retina, you want that retinectomy to be five or six clock hours, uh, which you would you ultimately achieved by, by opening it up as you did. So I think either going back to fluid is fine or doing it if it's easy enough and safe the way you do it. And I agree in a case like this with clearly expanding attractional forces, I would put a buckle on as well uh, as part of my case. Anybody of the panel would 
uh, inject gas in such a case? At the end, oh. I would use silicone oil. oil. Silicone yeah. oil. Anybody oh. will try gas for this case? Oh, no. Okay. So everybody agree with silicone oil. Okay. Yeah. The second question for me, it's just for me, even uh, uh, I'm a, a little bit experienced, but I need to, I have an answer. Do you think that enlarging the retinectomy more than that for the inferior 180 degree give the patient a better chance of avoiding re-PVR and re-proliferation or that is enough? I, I think that a case like that should be at least 180 degrees. I think it doesn't necessarily make you have less re-proliferation but you, it, it allows the tractional forces to be distributed in a way that if you start getting surface PVR developing again, your retina is likely to be in a relaxed, reopposed position. If you have it less than 180 degrees, usually you'll start to get those edges lifting in the corner. And you, you saw it even here where those areas were very thick. You, you start to get that again if it doesn't make it out to about 180 degrees. Okay, so agree. Uh, Dr. Ruggiero? Yeah, I agree entirely. Anything less than 180 inferiorly, something's gonna pull up on either side. He's absolutely right. When you know you're going back in, you have retinal redetachment and there's PVR and you've got new stretch holes inferiorly, that is foreshortened, vitreous base is contracted. Uh, I call it the smiley face three o'clock to nine o'clock, and that retina will lay down perfectly. And we, we published on this recently using that approach. Uh, you can be fully reattached and stay reattached over 80% of the time for those second, third, and fourth operations. If it didn't have a buckle, I wouldn't add it if I'm gonna be making that right. 180 inferior and then I'm putting oil in anyways. So um, often these cases already have buckles by the time they get to us, if it's coming from outside with two or three previous operations. But if there isn't one there, I know I'm going to make the inferior retinectomy and put oil, then no buckle is necessary at that okay. point. Okay, next case. <laughs> okay, uh, Noor, go who ahead. I'm sorry. Will, who will peel the ILM in this case? This is the second operation, uh, the previous operation. Well, you, uh, I, will I will try it, yes. I will try it, yes. Usually, I don't uh, uh, peel the ILM except if, if I see visible corrugation in the macular area. Sometimes I do feel if I remove the ILM without visible corrugations that I'm uh, uh, inciting some trauma to the macular function. Okay, I have a question for the panel regarding this case. The heavy laser is definitely going to produce inferior PVR and shortening. Uh, how many rows do you think are sufficient for you to do to prevent a shortening or uh, recurrence? For me, I usually apply two to three rows. Okay, Dr. Hassan? Yeah, I, I'm the same. And I think this is probably where you have really the art, the art of medicine rather than a, a strict rule. But I, I'm pretty much two to three rows in most situations. I think you don't want to be so heavy with your laser that exactly. you look like you've really burned it. Because then, yes, you've caused so much trauma uh, that you may elicit more, more PVR down the road. But you obviously also have to be complete enough that you can withstand the inevitable. Some scar tissue will develop. It, it, it has to, to repair itself. So you want to have enough of a barrier that that will not be overcome. So two to three rows is where most people, I think, are comfortable. Dr. Mateo? Um, Two to three rows to say the same, but you know, um, another point is try always be not so posterior to make your retinotomies. If you need it, of course you need it, but try to preserve as much as retina as possible. To have a, you know, to avoid reproliferation, more posterior, more reproliferation. Does anyone, uh, as Noor said, would consider doing an ILM peel? Absolutely, always in PDR. Always. It's mandatory. I think it's mandatory. Yeah, okay. Next case, please. Uh, this is a case of, um, again, right pseudophagic uh, subtotal retina detachment with a single upper horseshoe break, which was visible on the colored photograph after cutting 
of the all the 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 the, uh, the flaps and the associated vitreous uh, uh, traction, the posterior hyaloid again was stained, and as you can see, it's extremely adherent. Another flap tear was found up a nasal, which was not related to the detachment. After peeling, complete peeling of the posterior hyaloid, I did uh, have a choice, as Dr. Hassan uh, told us, either about drainage through the peripheral break or a posterior uh, retinotomy. But for this case, I decided to drain through the peripheral break by tilting the globe and I'm having chandelier inside the eye, putting the vitreous cutter in the, inside the break suction, fluid to fluid exchange at first, till most of the fluid would uh, be drained but I had modified this technique by using this clear depression posterior to the break to push the break, the fluid towards the periphery while tilting the globe to put the break in the most dependent part. And as you can see, pushing on the wall, the fluid passes to the side of the break, avoiding any fluid in the posterior pole and getting flattening of the retina and application of laser to the two flap tests. What do you think about the modification of the technique of drainage through the peripheral break? I like okay. it. Like, I, li <laughs> I like it. Very it's nice. Perfect. Do you think that this would work better that you push with this clear depressor, the subretinal fluid from the posterior area towards the periphery while tilting the globe and having chandelier inside the eye, then the fluid will be drained more and more without the need for a posterior retinotomy. Well, I think you're certainly using gravity uh, as your advantage there, and I think you're helping to milk that towards that area. So it's a, a lovely technique. You know, we have so many techniques. You're balancing putting the chandelier in the eye if you didn't have one before versus making a small, retin, you know, small little hole retinotomy or for fluorocarbon liquid. They're all Wonderful, and that's very elegant, what you showed, Ashraf. That's very nice, a nice technique. Okay, okay. next case, please. Next case, please. If Noor yeah. would like to speak, yeah, sorry. No, no. Uh, dear Ashraf, it's very nice. I sometimes did it, I mean, yeah, I mean, like you. And also, mm -hmm. also doing the laser in the same maneuver uh, after there is some, uh, maybe fluid remained, but with the indentation, you can laser, and the, sometimes we leave the fluid. So it's very nice, I think. Thank you. Uh, the next case is the diabetic case, uh, and uh, for me, the diabetic case, always you must have a bimanual surgery. One of the problems that we see in diabetics is the blood. If you leave this blood at any time to the retinal surface, it blood becomes very sticky and adherent to the retinal surface, especially in advanced diabetics. And if you don't remove it and try to remove it at a later stage, it's very adherent, it may tear the retina. So having two instruments inside the vitreous cavity, one of them like a flute needle or a vitreous cutter with suction all the time while mm. dissecting epiretinal membrane, the flute needle or the cutter is venting the blood. Don't leave the blood at any time on the surface of the retina, otherwise you are going to face problems like that. Peeling the clot from the retinal surface may end in tearing of the retina and you will get hydrogenic breaks. And in most of the time, you can do the job using just the vitreous uh, uh, cutter and, and the gripping forceps till you get complete clearance of the retinal surface and you do your air fluid exchange and your laser. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I was just presenting this case to highlight the importance of uh, bimanual surgery. Uh, do you have any comment on this case? Uh, I, I think this is a typical case I would use. This is a traction and regmatogen or retinal detachment. And this is the typical case I would use, you know, uh, viscovelamination in this case, because as, as Dr. Uh, Abu mentioned before, you know, it breaks the, the new vessels, but you know, they 
you know, confine the blood, you know, using the, the viscoelastic, then yeah, definitely the case for me would be to use the viscoelamination to help to avoid the bleeding. So please, I would like to ask the panelists about the fibrovascular band at the disc. It is, if you have a fibrovascular band at the disc, like Dr. Ashraf is showing now, and it is not attached to any part of the retina, do you choose to remove it or just to trim it and to cauterize the tip? Can I show my case? No, no, let's, let's have an answer to this question. Okay. Actually, I, 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 I always remove it. Uh, I know that I have a price when I remove it to have some bleeding, but I raise the, uh, the pressure and stop this bleeding. I never uh, trim and cauterize. I never cauterize over the optic nerve. Uh, the second thing also, uh, if you leave this stump, they was found that the incidence of the recurrent vitreous hemorrhage is higher. So when you remove the optic nerve stump, you decrease the incidence of recurrent postoperative hemorrhage. So I always remove it. Uh, and raise the intraocular pressure. Okay. Dr. Rigello, do you remove it or you would cauterize? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, both. Uh, it depends. Um, yeah, meaning if I see, like in this case, there looks to be contracture, and if I think it's, it's, it's creating traction and distorting the macula, absolutely peel it away. Uh, I'll, I'll leave small amounts and will apply some light cautery. As long as you don't trim it down too low, then the cautery stays away from the optic nerve. But a small um, a stock I will sometimes leave and cauterize. A larger, broader area, I tend to peel those because I do think it contributes to ongoing macular distortion because it will contract. So more often than not, the answer is I'll peel it off. Okay. Does anybody have another opinion? Okay. Um, okay. Actually, Next. I did peel it off, and again, there was new vessels on the retina elsewhere, which was you know, on bleeding, and I have to remove it and apply the diaphermy. Another point which I, I need to insist on preventive diabetectomy for preventive diabetic retinopsy is removal of the vibrovascular perforation at the vitreous base. As you can see here, this uh, patch of new vascularization at the vitreous base, if you don't remove it by shaving, this would contribute to the recurrence of post-operative vitreous hemorrhage. Yes. So uh, uh, in diabetic vitrectomy, it's not just a posterior vitrectomy, but you have to shave the vitreous base. Okay. <clears throat> I agree with you, Dr. Ashraf, in shaving the vitreous base in all diabetic vitrectomy, because if you lift this skirt of blood, it will dissolve and end in recurrent vitreous hemorrhage, except only in one case. Some cases we have longest standing organized vitreous hemorrhage attached to the vitreous base, which is very, very adherent. And when you try to remove this uh, organized adherent, longest standing vitreous hemorrhage, uh, completely, you might end with, uh, with a retinal tear or giant retinal tear. And sometimes you have to leave a small skirt uh, in such cases, and I think it will not hurt. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, next case, please, Doctor. Uh, this is actually my last case. This is a case of sub pseudophagic subretinal, uh, subtotal retinal detachment. And as Dr. Hassan had showed us, that in pseudophagic retinal detachment, uh, the, uh, one of the most important things that the cause of the brain, the detachment is small flat tears at the vitreous base. And you, if you don't exert a lot of time it's in steer depression and examining the retinal periphery, you may not found the brain. But this was a very small flat tear at the vitreous base. And as you can see, there was some chilling effect during the vitrectomy, fluid coming out of the brain. Uh, and in this case, although I have the technique I showed you for draining the subretinal fluid through the peripheral brakes, I decided not to do it because in this case, there was very small flat tears, which would not help me in draining uh, the subretinal space. So I decided to resort to uh, the other technique, which is a very small drainage uh, uh, central retinotomy air fluid exchange, flattening of the retina, and this was the drainage retinotomy. 
I'm still using it in the upper nasal part of the retina to be sure that the retina is completely flat and application of the laser to, to this very small flat tears, which was seen only by sclerer depression, and the retina was flat. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Asher. Does anybody has a comment on this? I think we have a question from Dr. Bahaeddin Ahmed. Uh, when to inject anti-VGF before vitrectomy in diabetics? We need an answer from the panelists. Okay, so can we start? Can you stop sharing, please, Dr. Ashraf, so that we can dive? Okay. Okay. Dr. Rigello, when do we stop? When would we inject anti VGF before surgery in a diabetic patient? I usually try to do it um, a few weeks before. If I'm concerned, and I think it's overstated, but if I'm concerned that I'm going to uh, cause contracture and, and increase the tractional detachment, um, I'll do it within five to seven days of the schedule to surgery once the patient's been cleared for surgery and has no health issues. But if I'm not concerned, and for I have to say for most cases, it, sh it is not a concern that they'll be making traction detachment worse, I'll do it two or three weeks at, two or three weeks is fine. Okay, Dr. Mathieu? Five to seven days before, if I use a vitrectomy. Dr. Hassan? Usually three to five days if I use it. I'm, I must admit, I'm, I'm using it less than I used to um, years ago when it first was talked about. But uh, if I do, it would be just three to five days before. Okay, Dr. Akar? Two to three days is enough. And I will, I will, I will go for that. Actually, I don't use ahead, it because... Go ahead, Noor. Go ahead, Noor. No, I wouldn't go for a longer because there's a very nice study that showed, I mean, we can wait until one week. I think it was like six days afterwards, the fibrous component increased dramatically. So uh, I think we shouldn't uh, be more than one week. But even I had a case, recent case that I shared somewhere here. So uh, now I think ideal one is two to three days even. Yeah. I, I agree with three days. I usually do three days before surgery. Dr. Sharawi? Uh, Actually, I don't like very much using anti vegf before surgery, except if the, the new vascularization or the fiber vascular perfusion are aggressively uh, vascular, but this is not actually the regular practice. But I usually depend on meticulous dissection because the anti vegf makes the fiber vascular adhesions more strong and it's sometimes very difficult to remove from the retinal surface. Okay, Dr. Mohsen. Uh, for me, it is something uh, that should be tailored according to the extent of the fibrovascular membrane. Actually, for me, two to six days is enough and should be tailored as, a, as I said. Okay. Actually, I'm right. Can I have a comment on this issue? Yes, please. please. Yes, please. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, I stopped injecting anti vegf before surgery as a routine. I only inject it in two, in two conditions. First, if I have obiosis iridis, uh, I inject it because it, uh, the regression of obiosis iridis helps to dilate the pupil better and uh, uh, less chances of, uh, of complication. And also in cases of florid diabetic and I have severe uh, vascular element, I also inject. But otherwise, I don't inject it as a routine. Second, I inject it only two, day, two to three days before rest. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we have a question, how and when to manage dense premacular hemorrhage post vitrectomy from Dr. Ahmed Gimei. Uh, okay, Dr. Hassan. Well, I think it, it comes down to how well you thought the original dissection was. I think if you were comfortable that you relieved all of the attraction from the retina, you identify the neovascular sources, and in particular, there's no hyaloid, left attached to new vascular sites, I think you can wait. You can wait uh, several weeks and you look for some clearing, some obvious signs that waiting is giving you at least some benefit. I think if it's been a very difficult case and you know that it's possible you've left some remnants of posterior hyaloid or there are some areas of traction that were not completely relieved, then I then usually 
if you're not seeing much benefit after two or three weeks, I will usually go in before more membranes will form. So it depends mostly on how well the original dissection was done for me. Dr. Akar? Uh, yes, I agree completely. If you do a good vitrectomy and there's a blood, we are not so maybe scared and we have to follow. But if there's still a lamella which just remained with the peripheric, uh, I remember a case uh, anterior hyaloidal proliferation even can develop. So we have to be always alert and watch the patient closely. And if not going to the good side, so get in and do the vitrectomy. And also, as Carlos Mateo mentioned, if the, it is a TPA injection also can be benefit if do, did, you did a good vitrectomy. Hey, Dr. Rigello, do you think there is a role for anti-VGF in such a case? Um. There may, depends, usually not. It's usually just oozing from uh, what you've been dissecting intraoperatively. So I, I doubt it's gonna do much. Again, I usually have that on board anyways, preoperatively. I may put it intraoperatively uh, if a case is, again, a very active sort of case. I'm waiting for the PRP to really kick in if there hadn't been much previously. Um, I may add it in at the end of the case too, but um, Usually, it doesn't do much for this type of post-op bleeding. Okay, Dr. Matteo. Um, I, as Nora Gar mentioned, I, I, I try always to avoid to enter in the eye again, and I try to first one, twice, or three times RTPA before to decide to enter again. So different. Okay. We have another question. Okay, that's that. What was extra? Okay. Uh, this concludes our uh, lovely and uh, wonderful night today. I really enjoyed your company. This was a very elite and uh, sophisticated speakers. Hopefully, we are going to repeat this by the end of July. Uh, and I wish you all to uh, stay safe, uh, have a nice uh, weekend, and uh, thank you so much. I would like to thank each and every one of you. I would like to thank Eva Pharma. I would like to thank my uh, dear friend, uh, Mohammed al Barada. he was a co-founder, uh, Mohsen also. Uh, I would like to thank everybody and uh, stay safe. See you soon. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you very much. Enjoy thank it. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. I think you live. <laughs> say, hello, say hello to your baby, okay? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.